Global Dairy Platform background in place. Uh, I did. I was trying to test it out. This obviously isn't the the one for the meeting, but resume recording. Mostly the recording is so that um, um, Mitch has got it for documenting this meeting. Now, Amanda, can I just test um, my share screen to make sure that when I try and present a presentation that you see it in full screen mode rather than in, you know, partial mode? Yep. One moment, please, Cola. Oh, not like that. Share screen. Share screen. Here we go. Can you see yep. full screen? I can see it. Lovely. Good afternoon. Good evening, Fritz. Hello. And, uh, good evening, Donald. How are you, sir? <laughs> How is the person after five hours of Zoom meeting and another three to go? <laughs> Fritz, if you want to politely just disappear after you've given your presentation, <laughs> it's entirely fine too. No, I, I will, I will uh, <clears throat> probably go off to have a cup of coffee or so. But uh, in principle, I, I'm planning to, to attend the meeting. A cup of uh, coffee? What about a glass of wine? Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think it, uh, what is it, 7 p.m. nearly your time? And it's, you deserve it's 7 it. p.m. It's yeah. uh, 10 to 7, yes. Yeah, I think you deserve it. So now, Fritz, um, do you want me to, to put your slides up or will you share your screen? I've tried to share my screen. Okay. Do you uh, want... I, I tested it with uh, Eduardo this afternoon. It worked. Do you but, want? Uh, do you want? Fall back share? position is that you do it. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to share your screen now so we can make sure it works here? Now, when I've got a screen up, Amanda, does it come up and ask, tell me that someone else wants to share their screen? I believe it does. Okay. So Fritz, you try it and see whether I've got to stop sharing first. You see, I already have a problem. No, that's not the one. Okay, I cannot do it because you have shared it. Okay, I will stop sharing. So you... No. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Now can you do it? <clears throat> Perfect. And now I have to. Yeah, I can. No idea. So that would work, huh? Yeah, that works and fine. It's a little bit easier if I can shift myself. We see, um, I see a big black box down the right hand side of your screen. Is that all of our pictures? That's yeah. gone. Is it better this way? It's a small black box now. You might want to move it up into the corner or something like that, if you can. That's it, yeah. That's it, just hides, it just hides the top corner of your screen, but that's not yeah. too bad, yeah. yeah. So Donald, um, just to try this out, um, while Fritz is sharing his screen. If you go on the top of yours where it says view options, yeah. you can do request remote control. Yeah, and so I should be able to 
So if Fritz says yes, then I can then I can control his slides. Right. So Fritz, um, if we had to go where you are, where I am sharing your slides, then you request control and I can give that to you. Okay, okay. But first, we, I'll try to put uh, it up. Sure. Yeah. Otherwise, um, there's not a big black box in the middle of the screen, um, but that's probably just whatever it is that we've, the request I think has come up oh. on the screen. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I, yeah, it's gone. Yeah. Okay. Great. So that's, okay. that works fine. And if, um, hi, Liz, if um, there is any difficulty, I can show slides and people can just say next slide and I'll click it forward, et cetera. Okay. For those that shared slides. Gosh, we've got a few people dialing in early. But I, I stop it now, isn't it? You have something else to show first. I, I do. So if you just stop sharing, I will um, okay. share mine. Great. We have um, Suzuki-san from Japan and we have Liz on the line already. Let me see whether I can improve the light a bit. I don't know. I thought you were I looking like, fantastic, Fritz. I like that poster behind him. That's a Gassel poster. I like it. Mm. Yeah, it's like a uh, holy... It's like a halo around you, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's a non-virtual background, Fritz. It's a, yeah, because <laughs> my virtual background like, uh, doesn't work. Yeah. It, it tells me that my computer doesn't support it. Yeah. And... Uh, I've not been able to change it. Right. I don't know whether Liz is trying to talk to us or someone else. I can see her talking. Sorry, I'm multitasking. I'm on the conference call and this. No problem, Liz. So uh, let's see whether we can top it. We had a, at one time, I think we had 180 people in the Africa one. We we have about fifty here, but I, yeah. I go for qu quality, not quantity, Fritz. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Hi, Ashley. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, very well. Eduardo, I see you've joined, and I, you wanted me to give you co-hosting rights so that you could um, record this for. How do I do that? No, I'll find oh. out. If you click. Yes. Hello. Hello, Donald. How are you? Good. Yes. Uh, you, you just have to go to the list of participants and find my name there. And, um, um, I can't because Amanda's the host and I'm only a co-host, so she'll have to do it. Well, See, maybe I, maybe you could. Maybe Amanda you could anyway. Me. Yeah. Amanda doesn't give me any authority. <laughs> ah, okay. I Hello. Uh, Hello, everybody. Hello. How are you doing? Hi, your host, Donald. Hello, Fritz. So, Eduardo, is this um, R6 for you today or in terms of these regional meetings? Uh, this is the third one. Wow. Uh, not today. Today we have had two sessions of Africa One and then your session now. But okay. on Monday, on Monday we had Oceania. So in total, we we are getting into the third one today. Third one, very good. Yes, Ashley, it looks like you're in the office. Are you back in the office already, or? Yeah, we um, we actually never closed. So uh -huh. I've been going back since May, um, and my kids are back in school. So um, that's good. I'm actually in Omaha, Nebraska, right now. That we had a. Um, I had to go out to a feed yard yesterday all day and do a do a photo shoot or a TV TV show. So anyway, so I am just at the airport early. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll uh, we'll uh, keep that in mind. So you you've got a flight to catch yes. towards the end of the meeting, I think, haven't you? Um, I actually think three twenty five is my flight, and I think this ends right at three if I'm got the Correct. time zone. Correct. So, um, so yeah, I should be, I should be perfect. I might have to be standing in line towards the end, but I should be able to stay at least stay on audio. 
no problem, no problem. Donald, can you just check to see if I've made you host now? You should have host access. Host, you have made me host, so I can now give Eduardo co-host. Yep. There you go, Eduardo. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. I was Amanda. just going to mention, so I'm not, I'm no longer multitasking, but at one o'clock we have a APHIS African Swine Fever working group. So I'll jump off, join that for an hour and jump back on this. So I think it should be after I'm done talking and before the panel that I'd be jumping off. Thanks, Liz. That's great. Um, we can always shift things around if we need to as well. Hey, and Donald, did you, um, I, I do have slides. I didn't know, should I, do you want me to just email those to Amanda, to you to run or, I, if, and I don't actually have to use them either, so. If you want to email them to me, Ashley, I can put them up and um, you. Fog, but it's turned into a beautiful day. Oh, nice. Very nice. And uh, Tim, I see you've joined us as well. Yeah, hi, Donald. Welcome. How are you? Good, good. I see you've still got the COVID beard happening. Oh, it's a lot tidier than it was a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. hey, hey, Donald, as we briefly discussed, um, if, if the agenda still holds, I'm going to go ahead and put myself on mute. I've got to take care of some other things, but I'll be back at least 30 minutes before my scheduled time, if that's okay. That's perfect. In the meantime, we'll just take your name in vain, Doug. That sounds good. All right. Thanks, Donald. Take care. Thank you. Esben, welcome. Donald, I did just um, send you a new slide set. I okay. split one slide into two, but I can either share a screen or we can send it or have you use the ones I just sent you. I, I haven't received them yet, Liz, but um, you know, like we said before, you can share your screen if you want to, or I can put the slides up and advance them if, if we need to. Larry, I see you've joined us as well. Welcome. Yes, welcome. How are you? Good, real good. Thanks for your help in uh, organizing our friends up in Canada, Larry. That was great. Yeah, no, I wish I could have uh, jumped on it. I had a few other things to do, but uh, thankfully Fawn's going to step in. It's great. No, that's excellent. And Alex, I see you've joined us as well. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Uh, just trying to get my video working right now. Yeah, no problem. We'll probably get everyone to turn their video off at some point. Otherwise, it may run really slowly. <laughs> Mr. Peerless, welcome. Thank you. I'll go off video. <laughs> we are expecting about 50 people to join today. At least that's the number that have registered. So we'll give everyone a, a couple of minutes past the top of the hour before we, we click into um, presentation mode. I have received your new slides, Liz. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Ashley, I haven't received yours yet. Okay. It says it is out of my inbox, so we'll see if it comes through. Not a problem. Not a problem. I'm open it. I might I might PDF it and, and just send it to you again just to make sure something sure. goes through here. Sure. Thanks, Ashley. And as I said to other presenters, there's no compulsion to use slides, but if you want to, happy to happy for you to do so, either to share your screen or send it to me and I can share them with, um, with everyone on the call. Mr. Butler, I see you've joined us. Welcome. Thank you. Greetings. Hi, Tim. Good to see you. Well, at least you sure. so far. <laughs> Good evening to you. Thank you. And Mr. Hardman, I see you've joined us as well. Thank you for making it. Yeah, you bet. How was the uh, leaving due last night? It was good. Good. Yeah, yeah. it was good. Well, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to catching up with Ian in due course in his new role, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. Fawn, I see you've joined us. Um, or no. you just I thought I we had Fawn. You. Yes, there you are. Hi, Fawn. Hi. Nice to see you again. Yeah, it's a pleasure to see everyone. <clears throat> And Suzuki-san, it must be very late at night for you. Oh, you've gone muted again. Suzuki-san from Japan. Okay, um, we're going to give it one or two more minutes just to let people connect on. One or two of our speakers are still to join. Hello, Paul. I see you've just joined us. Welcome. I'm here. It's always good when one of your first speakers turns up. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to share my screen, which has got a few um, uh, details and then we will move into um, listening to um, Fritz Schneider, the chair of Gassel. So just give me one moment to get myself organized. There's a lot of clicking back and forth required here. There we go. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yep. And yes. 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 <coughs> so um, welcome everyone. And um, to those of you I haven't met before, I'm Donald Moore. I'm the executive director of the Global Dairy Platform. I'm also a member of the guiding group for the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, and it's my uh, honor to welcome you all here today to this North American regional consultation where I will act as your moderator. But hopefully you won't hear too much from me because we've got a great list of participants and speakers to hear from today. Um, before I hand over to our first speaker, uh, Fritz Schneider, who is the chair of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, I thought I'd just share a couple of meeting protocols for today. If you wouldn't mind keeping your line muted when you're not a speaker, um, and perhaps only speakers use cameras. I don't know that there's going to be too many of us on the line, so for those who want to have their camera on, that's probably okay. Uh, if you could ask questions using the chat function in Zoom, I think we've probably all over the last six months become Zoom experts, so um, hopefully everyone knows how to use the chat function. But if you could use that to ask questions, that would streamline things. But if you do want to speak or to make an intervention, then use the raise hand function under the participants tab. I'll try my best to keep an eye on that. And as people raise their hands, we will, as time permits, we will um, invite interventions in the sequence that people have raised their hands. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Now, Fritz, um, you are our first speaker today. As I mentioned before, Fritz is the chair of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock. And we've asked Fritz to share some details about Gassel itself, for those of you on the line who maybe are not so familiar with Gassel and then a little bit about the uh, motivation for this year's Global Agenda meeting. So I'll stop sharing my screen at this point, Fritz, if you want to share yours, please. Thank you very much, Donald. I'll try to do this and I, it seems to work. Everybody sees my screen. I don't see anybody anymore. Yeah, yes, I, we can see your screen. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you, Donald, again. And <clears throat> for me, it's a pleasure to open this North American regional meeting. <clears throat> it's actually the third regional meeting we have. We will have eight of them. And the two we had were very interesting. And I'm sure this one here will also be very interesting. The Global Agenda has been working since 2011 to build a multi-stakeholder platform with the goal of promoting sustainable animal production around the world. 
let me briefly introduce you to the global agenda. Now we'll see whether it works. Yes. The main objectives of the global agenda are <coughs> to facilitate dialogue with multi-stakeholder partnership meetings, global and regional, and uh, to participate in meetings of our members, be it the Global Roundtable Sustainable Beef, be it CFS, the Global Dairy <coughs> Platform, and so on. We also assemble and communicate evidence. We do research by action networks and have publications. I'll come back to that a bit later. For instance, the Livestock Environmental Assessment and Performance Partnership, so-called LEAP, is a very important action network. Castle advocates for change in practice and policy. We, for instance, have supported the Mongolian Agenda for Sustainable Livestock. We have policy panels and we participate in the Global Forum for Food and Agriculture twice, 2018 and 2019, by invitation. We also have started more uh, regional meetings like last year in uh, Brazil. <clears throat> Where we look where Gasel came from. Coag, the Committee of Agriculture of FAO in 2010, asked FAO to start the global agenda. Ever since, we had nine global multi-stakeholder partnership meetings from Brazil to last year in Kansas in the USA. And in 2016, we got an endorsement of our approach and the governance structure by the Committee of Agriculture of FAO. We actually will report back to COAG again uh, end of October this year. Of course, it will also be virtual. Then from 16 to 18, we implemented an approved action plan of GASL and also now we are implementing another approved action plan and uh, recently, we have developed a series of change for the 22-24 action plan of the Global Agenda. When we look at our uh, governance structure, we have now 113 institutional members and they belong to uh, all strata of society. We have uh, <coughs> seven clusters and these clusters are <coughs> uh, guided by a guiding group and I'm chairing this guiding group. Uh, the actual work is, is done by the action networks. We have a number of action networks which are <coughs> technically oriented and they do <coughs> the uh, science work. They create evidence, make tools and guidelines available and enhance practice change. They are highly specialized and uh, <clears throat> they are actually all over the world. And <clears throat> these are networks mostly of uh, <clears throat> eminent scientists. When we look at the membership, we have <clears throat> uh, public sector, private sector, academic research, multilateral intergovernment organizations, NGOs, social movements, and we also have a separate cluster of, of donors. Uh, <clears throat> these are the members who are uh, financing us. <clears throat> the Global Agenda accepts the SDGs of the UN Agenda 2030 as its important reference framework. We are aware that actually all SDGs are rele relevant to livestock keeping, but the Global Agenda has identified nine with particular importance for the sector. These are the nines which are listed on the right-hand side of this slide. Uh, in 2018, we developed a strategic framework where we decided that we would uh, focus on four sustainability issues, food and nutrition security, livelihoods and economic growth, animal health and animal welfare, climate and nat natural resource use. And here this slide shows to which SDGs these sustainability domains refer to. We also have uh, sent to the organizers of the regional meeting 
uh, some definition of these four sustainability domains. <clears throat> of course, SDG 17 is, is very important for us. A successful sustainable development agenda requires partnerships between governments, the private sector, research and civil society. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> that's why the livestock sector, the stakeholders of the livestock sector have joined together to form the global agenda. And looking back at the two meetings which have already been uh, <clears throat> Uh, conducted Oceania and uh, Africa English speaking uh, again and again the request comes that the problem also of the COVID-19 can only be solved with multi-stakeholder action <clears throat> in 2020 we arrived in a situation that we did not imagine that is a COVID-19 pandemic this is a new and very demanding challenge that, despite generating a global crisis and the challenge in the sector, also provides us with useful lessons and opportunities for change to realign and reinforce our objectives. Our objectives towards a sustainable livestock sector. Usually, the Global Agenda has a multi-stakeholder partnership meeting once a year to bring together a wide diversity of livestock sector actors to address issues of sustainable development. Last year, we were in Kansas, USA. Of course, this year's meeting, which was initially scheduled for June in Switzerland, could not take place and has been postponed for one year. Instead, taking advantage of the virtual world we all live in at the moment, and all of us are experts by now, a series of regional meetings are being held in eight regions, culminating in a global meeting, lessons from COVID-19 for building back a better future through sustainable livestock. <clears throat> this regional meeting in North America is an important part of a longer term process to promote and advocate for sustainable livestock. This meeting will feed into the global meeting in two weeks time. Results and recommendations from this will inform the 2021 Global Agenda meeting to be held sometime in June, hopefully. And then these results will be used to promote sustainable livestock within the World Food System Summit taking place in, 20, in October 2021. In this context, North America stands out as an important livestock producer, part for the consumption of its population and part for export. The experience during this pandemic and thinking about the post-pandemic can generate opportunities, not only in the exchange of information between member countries, but also in its use for other regions of the world. I sincerely thank Donald Moore and his team for your highly appreciated interest and commitment. <clears throat> Normally, during the uh, annual MSP meetings, <coughs> we have a surge of membership and we hope that also these uh, virtual meetings, virtual MSP meetings, be it regional or global, will help us to increase our membership. So I invite all the participants who are in an institution who is not a member yet to get in contact with uh, Eduardo uh, and uh, we will give you information how to become a member. Uh, there is no membership fee. There are some uh, regulations, rules, how you can become a member. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> we are welcoming all to join. So end of my commercial. I now <coughs> wish us all an excellent meeting. And I also look forward to see seeing you all at our worldwide event between 14 and 18 September. Thank you again and see you soon. Thank you, Fritz. We do have time for uh, questions if anyone has them, but I don't see anything in the chat and I don't see any participants with their uh, hand raised at the moment. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen, Fritz. So I've uh, turned yours off. Um, hopefully everyone can see, um, see my screen again now.
so I've already covered the meeting protocols. As I mentioned before, if you have questions, please feel free to raise those using the chat function or to put your hand up. I see at the moment out of the 60 or so people who have registered, we've got about 30 on the call. So there should be plenty of opportunity for people to make an intervention should they wish to. Um, I thought it was worth me taking a moment to talk about the objectives for our regional consultation today. And these really come from the Gassel Guiding Group. And we have an opportunity to really discuss and present uh, today the regional impacts of COVID-19. So what is it that we've seen in the North American context um, and what are the drivers of change and the consequences that have arisen from that? And how did we as different stakeholder groups respond to the challenges caused by the pandemic? And really we'd like to look at those four sustainability domains as defined by, uh, by the global agenda itself. First one being food, nutrition, security, the second, livelihoods and economic growth, the third, animal health and welfare, and the fourth, climate and natural resource use. So those are the four domains that we are going to uh, operate across today. Um, the op option, I guess, for us, or the opportunity for us is to identify short, medium and long term how the livestock sector can improve its response through a sustainable livestock approach with solutions of a multi-stakeholder nature. So in terms of the outcome from today, uh, we can tailor this meeting however we see fit, those of us on the call. Um, we're looking for a common base for global consolidation. So ultimately, uh, we will be consolidating the findings from this North American regional consultation with the seven other regions that Fritz has mentioned to come up with a global position on uh, the impacts of COVID-19 and how we can build back a better future through sustainable livestock. Uh, there will be proceedings documented from this. Uh, Dr. Mitch Cantor, who works with me, is on the line, and Mitch will be producing uh, a proceedings document from this call that everyone will get a copy of, and then Mitch will also present those findings to the global GASL multi-stakeholder partnership meeting on September the 15th. Um, Mitch will also share some closing remarks today, summarizing what we've heard from our speakers today. So without further ado, it actually gives me great pleasure and I am absolutely uh, delighted to announce the eight speakers that we have for our session today. We're going to kick off with Paul Bleberg. Paul is the VP of Government Relations with the National Milk Producers Federation here in the US. Paul will be followed by Liz Wagstrom the Chief Veterinarian for the National Pork Producers Council. We then have Ashley McDonald with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and then Fawn Jackson from the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. So we're gonna hear from four different producer groups across, across North America, both Canada and the US. After the producer groups, we are going to hear about processors. So how do manufacturing processing companies cope and what are the learnings from that? And I'm delighted to have Doug Glade, the Executive Vice President and President of the Commercial Operations of Dairy Farmers of America, joining us today to share his views. Thank you, Doug. We then move on to the NGO community and um, my thanks to both Timothy Hardman, Director from World Wildlife Fund, and Esben Larson, a fellow at the Food Program at the World Resources Institute. They're gonna share a more strategic, high level and global viewpoint of, um, from the NGO community in terms of the impacts that they have seen. And then our last speaker today, but by no means least, uh, Alex Rinkus. Alex is Director of Communications and Stakeholder Engagement with the global animal care sector representing health for animals. We'll then have around 25 minutes or so for a panel discussion where everyone on the call has an opportunity to share their views. Uh, we'll start with questions taken through the chat function and then anyone who wishes to make an intervention or share other points may do so by raising their hand. And then Dr. Cantor will provide us with a summary of key points and we will close at 3 p.m. assuming that your moderator has done his job. So without further ado, if I go back to our first speaker, Paul, um, are you, did you have any slides or did you just want to speak to us today, Paul? I'm happy to just speak. I don't have any slides. That's 
perfectly all right. Thank you. So I will just shut down this sharing and um, you can start talking whenever you would like. All right. <clears throat> well, thanks very much. And, and to give everybody a little bit of background, my name is Paul Bleiberg and I am the Vice President of Government Relations at the National Milk Producers Federation based here in Washington, D.C. Um, before I go further, Donald, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you, Paul. Perfect. Just wanted to make sure that out the, out the gate. Uh, to give a little bit of background on who we are as a trade association, many of you probably know, but for those who don't, we are the trade association that represents dairy farmer-owned cooperatives, including Dairy Farmers of America, who I know is also on this call, Land O'Lakes, Select Milk, California Dairies, everyone around the country. And uh, we also happen to have the State Dairy Producer Associations and several others as associate members. And we basically function as the farm commodity organization on all things dairy in Washington, D.C. So with that, uh, with that brief backdrop, I'll talk through some of the challenges that we faced uh, amid the COVID-19 pandemic and how we've responded to those challenges, both on a government level and an industry level. And maybe I'll end briefly with just a touch point on lessons for the future, although we're, we're not out of this yet, so it's difficult to internalize with distance and time. We've not had the chance yet. Uh, to, to start by talking through the challenges, the pandemic could not have hit the dairy industry in a worse time uh, in a lot of ways. We were coming off of five very challenging years of low milk prices, as we've stated before, um, in many different contexts, and we were finally anticipating a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel uh, this year, and we were expecting the best year we'd had since 2014. It wasn't going to be quite that good, but it was going to be much better than we had had in recent years for a number of reasons. Unfortunately, by mid-March, uh, the situation changed quite a bit and we found ourselves in the throes of an unprecedented situation just like all of us did. To, to give you a sense of some numbers on consumption and why this was important and a big challenge for us, about half of the cheese consumed in the US, 25% of the fluid milk and about 60% of the butter are consumed through, away from home channels. They're not consumed through retail. So when the economy largely closed down in mid-March on account of the need to respond to the pandemic, dairy farmers around the country lost many, many markets for their milk. You had colleges sending kids home early, you had restaurants closing, you had catering, everything in food service was stopping. And so you had a very, very difficult time with, with a much larger amount of milk, in some cases exceeding a demand by as much as 10% than, than could be accommodated. So we, we were finding ourselves right away in a major glut that we weren't going to be able to manage easily. And on the processing side, we had shortages of personal protective equipment and things like that at plants, as I'm sure many of the other sectors on this call did as well. And so we're, we're sitting here in this situation trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to get through this? How are we going to, to respond and make the year at least as manageable as we can? And there were several things that we were able to, to do on the industry side, as well as some things that were done on the government side with our collaboration uh, that made the year more manageable. As it pertains to the industry side, fortunately, many of our co-ops had management plans already in place. They're often called base excess plans that many of you know to help get production down a little bit during the spring. And as folks know, the spring is always a, a time for large amounts of production. So that was only exacerbated this year by the challenge of lack of markets. So many of our co-ops did the hard work of reining in production gradually. As we were going through late March and early April, we didn't know what was going to happen, but we were fearful that tanker loads of milk were going to have to be dumped for weeks on end. And fortunately, that didn't end up being the case. We were able to cut production somewhat on the industry side. As many of you might remember, we made an ask of USDA to do this on the government side. That didn't occur. We were able to do it on the industry side and get production somewhat under control. And on the processing side, I made reference to plant issues gradually over time. Some of the equipment shortages and things like that um, were, were ultimately alleviated and met. I think we were, we were well served by the fact that a colleague of mine, my counterpart, Clay Detlipson, who heads our regulatory team, is somebody many of you have worked with and has been the chair of the Food and Ag Sector Coordinating Council with the Department of Homeland Security since 9-11. And Clay was really in the thick of the processing side issues, the plant issues, everything on infrastructure, making sure that food and ag was designated critical infrastructure um, through this period. And, and his work has been instrumental, which actually leads me into talking about some of the other responses. On the government response side, there were several things that were done. There were a number of administrative actions taken very early on 
by different departments to provide as much flexibility as could be provided. And obviously designating the food and ag sector as critical infrastructure was key. Another one was providing flexibility from hours of service regulations pertaining to, uh, to milk hauling and things like that. So that uh, in the event that milk had to be taken from one plant to a different plant that it would normally be taken, there was added flexibility to do that. So we were very grateful that that flexibility was put in place. Another item dealt with school meals, and this has been in the press somewhat in the last few days actually, but a large amount of milk is consumed in schools every year. And so we were concerned that with schools closing, you were going to have, um, you know, have a lot of milk that had nowhere to go. Fortunately, USDA put as much flexibility as they could into the school meal program to make sure that kids would still be getting dairy away from home. They took some steps to allow more flexibility as it pertained to milk fat varieties and things like that. Now, all of those regulatory steps were extremely helpful, but I think in terms of moving the market, which is what we saw happened over the summer as prices rebounded, a couple of items were key on the government side. Obviously a key item was the industry working to align production that I already touched on. On the government side though, we advocated very strongly and ultimately successfully for robust dairy product purchases. We felt that if you could move displaced product out of commercial channels and into food banks or other food insecure outlets, that would make a major difference in, in uh, aligning supply and demand a bit better. We were not advocating, as people know, to warehouse product as had been done under past price support programs and things like that, but we were advocating very strongly to get as much product moved as possible, and this happened in a number of uh, in a number of different areas. One was the Farmers to Families Food Box Program created by USDA, for which another billion dollars was just announced last week. Um, another was this ongoing Section 32 product purchases, and so those product uh, purchases have been very helpful, especially in places like the Upper Midwest, where you have cheese and butter and a lot of products that were. Uh, that were displaced. Not, not as much in the Southeast, which is more a fluid market, but I think overall, a lot of that activity has been very, very helpful in, uh, in getting product out of uh, commercial channels where it wasn't gonna be able to be consumed. The, the other item was the product of work done by Congress and ultimately by USDA as well, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, which was the direct payment program set up by USDA using funding that Congress had provided in the CARES Act that they enacted back in March. And fortunately, that program provided significant assistance to dairy farmers. As of yesterday, it's provided about $1.7 billion um, to dairy farmers across the country. And it runs through, the sign-up runs through next Friday, so that number may go up by the time we're done. And USDA has indicated that when that program runs out, they're going to do a second round. And that's been extremely helpful. That program is based on quarter one price losses, as well as quarter two marketing disruptions for dairy. And that's significant assistance to producers across the country of all sizes. There have been obstacles there around payment limitations that we've had to work through that have impacted some of the larger producers, but we have seen some success in, uh, in getting those adjusted in, in a way that would be, uh, in a way that'll be more flexible and that we, could, uh, that we could deal with. So some critical steps have been taken on the government side as well. We are hopeful for some additional steps here in September. The Congress is expected to come back in the session before the election and possibly pass another piece of legislation pertaining to the pandemic. And I think we're hopeful that there'll be additional support for agriculture there. In addition to direct payments, we continue to make the case for product purchases and we continue to make the case around whatever opportunities can be realized to enhance milk donation. We think that's greatly important as well. Uh, to set up a, a program that'll sort of create an incentive not to dump milk. You don't want to create an incentive not to sell on commercial channels where it's viable, but can we have a medium where milk could be donated and reimbursed at a, at a lowest class price potentially, uh, depending on, on the situation. And we made some headway on that in the last uh, U.S. Farm Bill in 2018. Uh, where we're looking to build on that now in light of the pandemic. So that's another area that we continue to work on. I, I think as we as we wrap up here and we talk about lessons learned, obviously, as I, as I laid out here, we've been responding in real time, both on a private industry side and a government side to some of these challenges as, as best as we can. And I know everybody who's been impacted is doing the same thing. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the one of the big lessons for us uh, that we hope people will take away is the importance of risk management. You know, we go out of our way every year to promote uh, risk management options for dairy farmers. The, the U.S. Farm Bill created the uh, dairy margin coverage in the last 
go around in 2018, and that was very effective last year in 2019. Uh, not as many producers signed up for that program this year in 2020 because the futures at the end of last year looked like it was going to be a better year as I started my comments. Turned out that wasn't the case. And so I think on a going forward basis, certainly as a lesson learned, we're going to be leaning in really hard on industry across the board about the importance of programs like DMC, like Livestock Gross Margin Dairy and some other private products make sure that people are, are reminded that it's important to get into these programs, not just when you anticipate that you're going to get a payout based on what the futures say, but all the time because you really don't know at the end of the day. And so that's one major takeaway. I think an, another major takeaway or lesson learned is the importance of coordination. And I think the work that was done and continues to be done on the Food and Ag Sector Coordinating Council is critical uh, to, to all of that. I think you know, we were, I think, somewhat fortunate in dairy that we didn't endure some of the challenges on the plant side that some of our friends in the livestock sector did, but I think we certainly wanted to be working together and supporting others in ag as much as possible. I think I saw a lot of really good efforts over the course of this year from different ag organizations trying to figure out, okay, this is not priority number one for us, but we know this is a big priority for you. How can we be supportive? And I think it did make the ag community and has made the ag community stronger because there have been quite a few uh, cases this year, whether it's talking about providing more funding for USDA, product purchases, you know, personal protective equipment, anything like that, where we've all tried to row in the same direction as much as possible. That's not always easy in ag, as, as everybody knows, but I think a major takeaway and hopeful lesson learned for everybody uh, will have been the importance of that. Um, beyond those two points, I think it's it's a little early to know in, in um, some ways, right? And, you know, the pandemic did put a spotlight on some of the challenges we already had with regard to production and things like that. I think we managed as best we could. But once we've had, as I said earlier, the distance and time from the pandemic to be able to look back and really internalize, you know, things that happened and things that could be prevented in the future, we'll probably have more lessons learned, so to speak. But, but certainly from my perspective and our perspective, those are two uh, right off the bat. So, uh, Donald, I think I'll conclude my comments there and we'll be happy to participate uh, in the Q&A and panel discussion later if folks have follow-up questions. But I hope that's a helpful overview for everyone as far as the impact that the pandemic had on our sector, uh, maybe with a little bit of emphasis on the timing of it, as I said before, given that we certainly could not have had this happen at a worse time and, uh, and how we've responded and what we hope to take away. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate your comments. Um, for those of you who have recently joined the call, we will be having a panel discussion towards the end, so feel free to think about questions that you might like to ask via the chat function or raise your hand uh, using the um, Zoom raise your hand function under participants so that you can uh, ask questions at the end as well. Um, I was remiss in not um, pointing out at the beginning that we are recording this session. Um, our friends from uh, Gassel would like to post some segments of this onto their website, and uh, we're also recording it so that uh, Dr. Mitch Cantor, who will be writing the proceedings up from this, doesn't have to furiously write down all the things that people are saying. So we are recording. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have had 60 people register. Our registrants come from not just Canada and uh, the United States, but we have from Nigeria, from France, from Italy, uh, Germany, obviously Switzerland with the chair of Gassel, and we also have people from Argentina, uh, Japan, and Ireland registered. So quite a broad range of people um, have signed up for our call today. So without further ado, our next speaker is Liz Wagstrom. Liz is the Chief Veterinarian with the National Pork Producers Council. Liz, would you like me to share your slides from my screen and would that be easiest for you? Let me see if I can work it this way. Are you able to? We are. We can see your, we can see your slides. Um, on slideshow because I had everybody's pictures up over where it says slideshow. I think we're good now. Thank you so much. And I think you'll see some um, similarities between what Paul had to say and what we have to say. Um, the pork industry in the United States was also coming off several years of low prices. Um, a lot of that was uh, based on tariffs that had been implemented um, on our exports. And so we had had some, some challenges. 
Um, we also had some of the same challenges that um, dairy had in um, food service. About 70% of our food, uh, bacon goes through food service. But um, our biggest challenges, um, rather than trying to repackage and relabel products that would go to food service for retail, was in our packing plants. And so we we uh, focused on March 10th and, and NPPC, for the, those who don't know, is the advocacy arm of the pork associations um, in the United States. So we focused on legislation and regulation and trade. And so as early as March 10th, we were very concerned about the potential for pork supply chain disruptions um, due to labor issues in our packing plants. And um, unfortunately, we um, saw our worst case scenario happen. And what happened is uh, we saw an increase in human um, infections in our meat packing plants. Um, very few on farm, but uh, quite, quite significant numbers of infections in the packing plants that caused closures and slowdowns. And those closures and slowdowns were driven not only by uh, employees that tested positive and may have been ill, but also by fear, people who were afraid to come to work and thus we had high levels of absenteeism. And so um, as the packing plants worked with public health to increase those safety protocols, it did lead to reduced workflow as they reopened plants. So you looked at social distancing within the plant, adding barriers between workers, doing health screens of workers coming into the plants, um, taking temperatures, adding hand washing stations, all of those things that helped um, address public health issues in the plants also led to slowdowns within the plants. And so we had, um, had those slowdowns and closures that caused us to have pigs that had no place to be marketed at. There were many days when we had over 100,000 pig capacity declines. So we have, um, you know, in a week, we could have more than half a million pigs that should have gone to market, should have been made into meat, that were still on farms. And so our latest USDA hogs and pigs report indicated that around 2 million animals disappeared. And we'll talk a little bit more about what disappeared meant. But, but there are 2 million animals unaccounted for um, in, the, in the difference between what was on farm and what was reported as having been processed in the, in the major packing plants. It's also estimated that we have over a quarter of a million sows out of about 5 million that have been liquidated. So producers that are either downsizing herds or are exiting the industry. And so we're uncertain how many farmers have quit producing pigs. We know there will be some significant number. We've had one large producer, Maxwell Foods, that has, has exited the industry or is exiting the industry, but others that um, are smaller that will also exit the industry. So it's very tenuous times within the pork industry still, still today. As we looked at the backup of pigs, as those pigs that couldn't go to packing plants, solutions were difficult. And that's because the way we flow pigs through our barns, in our modern production, um, we focus on all in, all out. That means we will fill a barn with age um, matched pigs um, over just a matter of a few days, keep them there until they're ready to go to market, and then as they go to market, they'll wait till the barn gets totally emptied, wash it up, and you have younger pigs right behind there ready to go in. So downtime on our barns is just a matter of days per year. It's not like there is a lot of extra barn space around. So some of the things people did was um, with their younger pigs, it would be newly weaned pigs or nursery pigs, they'd um, double and triple stock them in, in those barns that they'd be expected to stay in till market. So there was room for lots more younger pigs in those barns, but now as time has gone on, we have to find a space to move those double and triple stock barns 
um, pigs into other barns. We altered diets on heavier pigs. In fact, there is some solutions um, that we're hearing where people have not only kept pigs from gaining weight, but they also actually lost weight. Um, so we, we really um, have slowed up a lot of growth. Um, again, that's great when we don't have markets for the heaviest pig to go to, but that's causing um, downstream concerns with those younger pigs that should be moving into the space. Those heavier pigs should be vacating. We have producers who either um, are not breeding um, sows or have had to abort sows to have fewer younger pigs coming behind. We know that uh, producers are very aggressively culling um, based on health. So lightweight pigs, pigs that are not doing well, that maybe they would have tried to keep and make into, you know, get them to market. A lot of those pigs have been culled just to create space. And then there is this whole idea of alternative markets and alternate markets. And we have producers who would do anything rather than to kill a healthy pig for, um, for no reason, uh, for a reason of marketing uh, or lack of marketing. And so we know that we had farmers in the Midwest who have sent pigs to other places in the United States. Um, we know that there was a lot of animals donated um, to food shelves. Um, and we, we'll talk a little bit in the next slide about some of those alternate markets, but we do feel there were some significant numbers of animals that went to those alternate markets. Um, and we still have concerns with excess animals. We knew that fall was going to be a time of tight supply anyway, um, or excess demand. And now with all of these animals that have backed up, um, we have concerns that we are still have somewhere between two and three million excess animals in the pipeline that need to be um, uh, marketed yet this fall. So some of our alternate markets, and this is a picture I took off a friend's Facebook page, included direct from farm sales of live animals. This is a farm that's not very far from Omaha, Nebraska, which is a fairly good sized city. They sold live animals to people who would come to their farm and then help the people who bought those live animals um, process them uh, or kill them and process them on the farm. We had um, people send uh, animals to smaller processors in non-pork states. So we heard about pigs from Iowa that's in the center of the nation going to Pennsylvania on the East Coast, Iowa or Idaho on the Western part of the United States in Georgia in the Southeast. In um, certain states where they have a lot of processors that would be processing deer and elk and other wild game, many of those processors opened up early from hunting season and increased capacity to be able to process pigs for people. You know, our concerns with that were both potentially food safety concerns, because a lot of these processors or a lot of people that may be processing on farm are not going to be as familiar with food safety considerations um, and also our animal welfare considerations. We had significant animal welfare considerations, worried about space considerations, about um, transport uh, to areas further away from where we would normally transport animals. And as uh, the next slide we'll talk about also um, welfare around depopulation. So to preserve animal welfare, some animals were depopulated. We had farmers who couldn't find alternate markets. They didn't have um, packing plants that were able to take those animals. They were animals that were overcrowded and they had young animals coming up behind. And so some of those animals were depopulated. It's uncertain how many were. We know there, it's in the hundreds of thousands and perhaps over a million. Um, and so we as an industry work to provide methods that were um, humane and approved by the American Veterinary Medical Association. So some of the work we did was to look at um, uh, sources of carbon dioxide, looking at sources for vaporizers to deliver carbon dioxide, 
worked on methods around adding heat and humidity to be able to um, use the approved ventilation shutdown plus methods. All of those were really difficult decisions and there is no good way to feel good about euthanizing healthy animals and know that you're going to put them in a hole in the ground. It was devastating to farmers. It was, um, I went out to some farms that were depopulating animals and um, I cried. I mean, it was just really a tragedy for both the farmers and the animals. But once those animals were depopulated, we had to work on how do you environmentally do responsible disposal of those animal carcasses. So we worked on some projects. Um, some of our states did put together state um, grind and compost sites where they would use large grinders used in the lumber industry to grind carcasses um, and mix them with carbon sources so they could be composted. That way you have composting that um, takes just a matter of weeks instead of you know, up to a year. We also funded projects on shallow burial, which is kind of a combination between composting and burial. Our rendering industry came, um, did, you know, really um, increased some of their capacity. The renderers tell us they think that they rendered about a million pigs, market hogs. So it was a combination of, of how can we um, utilize the most environmentally responsible methods and how can we do projects to also help us learn um, how to um, maximize those methods in case we need to use them for other reasons. We, um, there was a lot of press around these and we did have advocacy groups that were um, concerned about the methods and, and the, the state of the industry. So there are two petitions that were delivered to USDA. One asked uh, for to ban mass burial and on-site incineration of, of animals during the pandemic. We're not aware of anybody who used on-site incineration. That's not a method that, that we're familiar with anybody using. Um, anybody who buried animals um, that was helping to get um, money or any funding from USDA for that burial. Those burial sites were approved by conservationists to be um, environmentally appropriate. And um, as I mentioned, the state sites that were put together for the um, shallow burial or the composting, those again were also approved by either state or federal conservation officers to minimize any runoff or environmental um, issues around that. The second petition just went to USDA about two weeks ago, and that was focused on depopulation methods. Um, we do not use foam for um, depopulating pigs, but they do in the poultry, and there was some poultry that was depopulated. So it was ventilation shutdown and water-based foam methods that were uh, the petition to USDA went to try to ban those methods. Um, both of those methods have been researched and um, have been um, approved as methods that could be used for depopulation by the American Veterinary Medical Association. Um, our ventilation shutdown um, included in the, in the barns that use that the addition of both heat and humidity so that within um, a matter of um, 90 minutes that over 90% of animals would be depopulated or would be, would be killed. So there was a time, temperature, humidity, and a goal on, on what animals, what percent of animals would be humanely euthanized in that, in that amount of time. Um, it caused some concerns within the veterinary organizations. I think many of our small animal veterinarians were not aware of how those um, standards were um, adopted by AVMA, and they were not aware of the additional um, addition of heat and humidity to try to make it a quick process. This was not people turning off the fans, walking away from a barn, and then hoping that, you know, after a while animals would be dead. It was, it was monitored. It was focused on um, getting the most animals euthanized in the quickest time possible. 
Um, one of the opportunities and lessons learned is we ended up having daily state and federal animal health official calls with our top 15 state veterinarians and our USDA. We identified agencies that could provide resources to the National Natural Resources Conservation Service. We worked with our federal emergency management people. Um, we looked at all sorts of different agencies and departments that could help us. USDA did help with purchases of additional depopulation equipment for the National Veterinary Stockpile. They'd really focused on depopulation of poultry rather than large animals. And we worked a lot with public and private partnerships and initiatives. So our pork industry, as well as our packing plants put in um, both funding as well as uh, time to try to develop um, educational uh, pieces, methods, research uh, studies, et cetera, that we could do um, put together. We also put together an instant management team and focused um, various individuals within our organizations on public health, animal welfare, depopulation methods, disposal methods, and production. And that um, issues management team was very, good, very beneficial in helping us keep our um, keep from duplicating efforts, but keep people on track. Another, some of the lessons we learned is our emotions run high during a crisis and communication will sometimes blunt help tremendously. So those daily calls with our state and federal animal health officials were essential. And then having industry help itself. So in addition to us asking for help from state and federal governments, um, the National Pork Board put in millions of dollars of, of um, funding to help buy equipment and to help do research. And so it truly was a public-private partnership. And the other thing I think we learned is that this was probably better than any full functional exercise or uh, drill for a foreign animal disease. And so lessons we learned from this situation need to be applied to our foreign animal disease planning. So our depopulation methods, we learned a lot, but we were not in a disease situation. So we were able to move animals to central depopulation sites that probably wouldn't happen in a foreign animal disease. Our disposal methods, we were able to move carcasses. They weren't diseased carcasses. Again, you need to think about that in a foreign animal disease. Um, I think we have lessons on diagnostic test development and deployment that we look at the public health side and we need to be better prepared for a foreign animal disease, and also data management is going to be key. And so with that, it was kind of a run through of some of our crises, uh, definitely focused more on um, not having markets for live animals rather than in the dairy industry, the change between um, marketing streams for dairy products. Thank you, Liz. Um, there have been a number of questions asked during your presentation. There's two of them I'm going to hold and um, probably introduce during the overall Q&A at the end. But there's one that I think uh, we'll just touch on very quickly now. And that was a question from Esben. He was he just curious as to how many mother sows did you say had been slaughtered? What was the percentage of the total mother sow group? We've been told that about 250,000 sows have been liquidated. We have about just under 5 million sows in the United States. Now those are ones we know have been liquidated. I'm sure there are more that we are just not aware of. You know, it hasn't been made public, but, but I would think we will have a, um, we will have probably somewhere I, you know, just ballpark a 10% decrease in, um, in the size of the U.S. swell herd. Great. Thank you for that. And as I mentioned, the other two questions, which you can see in the chat, um, I think are good questions for all of our speakers. So I'll bring them both up towards the end. So thank you, Liz. Um, very much appreciate your uh, insight into what happened within the pork industry. Our next speaker is uh, Ashley. Ashley, are you still, I'm just trying to see you down the list here, Ashley. Um, have we still got you on the line, Ashley? Yep. Yes, Great. I am now, here. Ashley, I, I can share your, your slides um, if you want to just tell me um, to advance them as we go through. I'm happy to do that. That would be hopefully, perfect. Thank you, Donald. Hopefully those are on the screen now, Ashley. Yep. 
Yeah, that's great. Thank you, and and thanks um, thanks for asking me to do this. I, I think um, a lot of again, a lot of what I was going to talk about has probably been covered by both Paul and Liz. So um, I will I'll be fairly quick in running through some of these slides. Um, so Donald, if you want to um, just go to the next one. Um, so I, I just identified some key timelines, and and again, I, I kind of stole this from somebody, but um, starting in March and going all the way through May. Um, some big events that happened, um, of course, in the, in the beef industry here in the U.S. And um, unfortunately for, for Paul, a lot of uh, what happened in the beef industry, of course, then added to the, the sorrows that they had in the, in the milk industry is 20 percent, of course, of the, um, the beef in the U.S. Uh, comes from, from the dairy industry. Um, so, so just highlighting the first one there, again, we're starting it in March uh, when, when businesses uh, start to close, especially uh, restaurants. Um, so if you go to the next one, you see with, um, it, as we started seeing increases in uh, in illnesses in plants, and we saw some slowdowns there, which I'll get into in a second. Um, so just a, a quick a quick show of, of prices starting to go, starting to be depressed um, in, in the cattle markets, and, and that's across um, across the board. Um, so as those, um, so if you go to the the next one, as you, you, you know those um, those price declines, of course, start to uh, start to hurt producers in marketing their calves, either going into so they're backing up in the feedlot sector, of course, um, and so uh, some producers then who had their calves ready to then go to um, feed yards. Um, actually ended up, if they were able, uh, which not all of them were, but if they were able, of course, they kept them on farm. Um, and so that was, is one of the differences, of course, with the beef cattle industry. We are able, of course, to keep them on those um, those pastures and rangeland um, if if need be. Um, and, this, and this was that situation. So there was a time we could keep them um, and hold them back um, that would otherwise have gone to the, to the feed yard. Um, of course, uh, another unique challenge, of course, to the beef industry then is, um, is how droughts, of course, affect forages. And so running out of actual forage um, by holding those calves back longer, of course, can become a reality um, and, and running out of that feedstock. So, uh, so that was another concern that, that our folks um, were dealing with. So you see in this number two, um, ground beef starts going up, uh, the year over year price um, starts going up. Um, so as you see live cattle, of course, prices go down, you see retail prices go up. Um, so if you go to the, the next slide there, Donald. Um, so, so similar to other uh, agriculture commodities, about 80% of our beef is uh, in, in food service. Um, and so uh, we saw a, a challenge in shifting that product from retail, uh, or sorry, from food service over to retail. Um, so at the same time, you saw meat department uh, going up. Uh, we saw people um, hoarding uh, beef um, in many retail outlets. You saw signs that said you could buy a maximum of two meat products, um, and that and that one, of course, across all the proteins. Um, and so we saw people again stocking up their freezers because they were they were scared. Um, so maybe one of the bright spots in here that that we saw um, that was encouraging was that when 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 times are tough or when people are panicked, uh, they do go to the livestock industry to provide some comfort that um, you know that some, we called it comfort food in in a lot of instances. Um, things like things like roasts. Um, and other things kind of came back uh, to the family dinner table. Um, we saw an increase on the beef. It's what's for dinner uh, website that has recipes. We saw a huge increase in a number of people going there for beef recipes and figuring out how to cook our product. Um, so a little, a little bright spot there, but we did see those prices um, start to go up. Um, but of course, that's at the same time live cattle prices are, um, are going down. So if you go to the next one, Donald. Um, so there, there were some other unique things um, that happened. Um, so one of those was um, that that because of that disparity, we had box beef prices going out at all-time highs um, at one end of the packer plant, but we had a, a depressed prices on the live cattle side. 
Um, so we did see our, our packers, um, a few of them stepped up and paid um, uh, paid five dollars per hundredweight to, to cash prices. Uh, I think it was the week previous or a couple weeks previous um, from one date. Um, so th so that was um, a unique intervention um, that uh, that the packers took on themselves uh, to to again kind of cut that disparity disparity that that was being seen in the market. Um, so if you go to the next one um so again going back to this was uh quick both quick service and full service um, restaurants so you see you know the, the the drop in price there um quick service was able to to come back a little bit obviously drive through stayed open um and, and full service really took um, a huge hit in in many states and and overall in the country you go to the the next one real quick um, and, and so these are just some of those, um, again, some of those percentages that, that you all probably are well aware of. Um, so we had a, obviously, if you go to the next one, Donald, if you, if you think about um, the beef industry here in the U.S., um, if, if you know a lot about it, you know that we have some, uh, uh, some bigger plants that process, you know, 4,500, 5,000 5, uh, head of cattle per day um, and on, on tarp, tight margins and, and that is incumbent on a constant flow of those cattle coming in and constant labor force um, make, being in those plants to make those plants go. Um, on 4:15, on April 15th, you saw the JBS Greeley plant, which is a big, a sizable plant. You saw that one go down. Um, this, of course, just for some context, uh, similar to, to what Paul had said about um, some previous years being concerned for, for milk prices. You know, we're we were coming off of a, a dynamic, a volatile market uh, event, uh, black swan event, as everybody's calling it, uh, from a fire in one of our major plants in, in Kansas the year previous, and that had really wreaked havoc um, on our on our um, fed cattle markets. And then and then we come back just a few months later, and we see the coronavirus impact, um, and so it was really uh, really challenging for um, uh, for our producers. So if you go to the next one, so a number of those big producers, um, you know, shut down, slowed capacity. Um, it, it was just, uh, you, you know, Liz, Paul, and and Fawn can probably attest. It was every day just looking at the news to see which ones were going down next, and you could just see um, strong trends. And and that's of course I know probably shared around the world, um, but and it was no different, of course, in, in the beef industry. Uh, go to that next slide and probably can probably go to the next one too. So slaughter dropped significantly with that, um, with that stat you see in there into, um, into April, you see that strong, <laughs> that strong drop in that blue line. Um, and so that's where you saw the bottleneck between a packer capacity. We had the cattle. And then if you think back about um, the strong demand on the retail side, we had the strong demand, but of course those things uh, bottleneck in the middle with that packer capacity, and that that of course was was our issue. Um, so if you keep if you keep going to um, the next one real quick, um, you'll see. So just to highlight that um, the the Wendy's announcement. So if you go again to the next slide, um, Wendy's posted on on outside some of their restaurants that um, because they had issues with their beef supplier that they no longer had hamburgers. Um, uh, for the poultry industry, it looks like at least at this store they had chicken still, but um, but they didn't have any hamburgers, and so that drove a lot of worry in the marketplace. Again, looking at those those as the folks that were hoarding beef in the in their freezers, causing a problem in the the retail sector of having um, what looked like a shortage of beef. Of course, we didn't have a shortage of beef. We had. Uh, we were trying to figure out how to get it from the food service side over to the retail side, and that became um, that became our challenge with with keeping um, keeping beef in stores and um, and in in some of our quick service restaurants. Um, so one thing Liz mentioned, if you'll go to the next one that um, I'll mention as well, is um, direct to consumers, um, and I think uh, we had a lot. Of strong desire to to um, for local beef, um, grass finished beef, and even uh, locally grain finished beef, um, pro locally processed, 
and you know the the beef checkoff um the beef councils across the state uh tried to do their best to try to connect uh, producers with those consumers yeah. who are willing to buy. So I think that's one thing we have to, uh, I, th I think at least I'm interested to see where that one goes, uh, how much of that will stay, how many consumers want to continue to get that beef straight um, straight from the producer. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we might we might continue to see that. Again, a, a lot of that brings up those concerns, of course, that, that, Liz, um, that Liz already mentioned. So if you go to the, the next one, um, and again, I'll, uh, I'm skipping there towards the end, and, and Paul really covered it. Um, the applications for the uh, coronavirus food assistance program, uh, the applications um, were open um, at that time, and that provided a lot of assistance to our producers, um, and I think helped, helped calm the market. So if you go to the next one, um, and, and um, I'll sum it up kind of here, um, we, we kind of are back to, um, we've solved some of the issues, um, of course, they, you know, in, increased PPE, increased safety measures in packing plants, but we are back to, you know, 95 plus uh, packing capacity. Um, beef right now, beef production is higher than it was um, year over year um, and higher than a five-year average. So. Um, we're seeing that, that most of the backlog that was in the feed yards has been, um, has been solved with those packing plants coming um, back online. One of the lessons I think we have here or, or something to watch um, in, in that regard is um, there, there is a push, there's a considerable, considerable push for more regional packing plants um, around uh, the U.S. Again, looking back to the Tyson fire, when one plant went down, uh, we had major market implications, um, and, and this event as well, um, it, it does lead to the question if we have more uh, smaller packers and processors across the country, um, you know, does that protect us um, from some of these, you know, impacts? Um, uh, long term, uh, beef demand still uncertain. You know, we did see a number of people kind of uh, switch. Um, you know, I, I think we still have to just watch that. You know, the question is whether did we did we lose any market share one way or or another. Um, and but again, I come back to the fact that a lot of people took comfort um, in meat products during that time and and maybe rediscovered them, rediscovered um, the the you know, being around the family dinner table and, and sharing a meal around a, a pot roast or something like that. Um, so I think that's something that we will continue to watch, at, at least at NCBA. Um, production will likely continue to be higher as, as we continue to, um, the rest of this year, as we continue to get rid of that backlog, both on farm and, and in the feed yards. Um, and um, some, some quick lessons learned here, and, and I'll share a little bit of consumer data too, um, is that while we, while we thought uh, that we were pretty nimble, uh, I think we need, you know, from the, the packing sector and across the entire beef supply chain, we need to be more nimble. We need to figure out how can we shift that product from um, one supply chain going into um, food service, right? how can we shift that quickly over to retail and how, how can we do that better? Um, the direct to consumers issue um, that, that I mentioned and, and Liz mentioned as well, uh, how can we do that better, frankly, if, if that if we think that is going to stay around? Um, and, I, and, I, and I have a, a little chart um, here in a couple of slides on um, willingness to pay that I think kind of might tie into that too. Uh, employee safety. I think we saw a focus on employee safety, especially in the packer and processor um, sector. Um, and, you know, we have to be able to, to understand that concern. Uh, you, you know, and respond to it um, quicker than we did now. I think those protections will stick around as they should, um, but I think it, it highlighted um, something, and, and I think we will continue to work on that as an industry here in the U.S. Um, in our plants. Um, I mentioned packer capacity already and, and whether, whether we will see um, increased facilities or, or around the state um, going forward. There's a couple examples of, of some opening or going to open uh, even even already. Um, and then 
and then risk management. So also has, has been mentioned, but probably maybe for the producer sector, um, the most important thing. We have, um, you saw those prices when they, when they tanked, if they were not protected in some risk management um, form or fashion, uh, that really hurt a lot of producers. Um, even, you know, even um, fairly recently, you know, uh, fed cattle were still losing $200 a head um, if they were not priced, you know, if they didn't have risk management um, tools in place. Uh, so, you know, I know that's something that uh, NCBA is going to work even harder on than it had pre previously is either fixing um, fixi fixing systems that, that exist through federal statute or um, or even utilizing new and unique ways of risk management tools. Um, on the sustainability front, one of the things that, that, that I work on personally is uh, ecosystem services markets. Um, and I think that, that, again, all of that, um, you know, that, that's a diversified revenue stream that producers uh, could tap into, uh, assuming the market uh, functions at some point, um, that, again, uh, manages risk overall for an operation. So I, I think those are, um, so whether that's through education, training, uh, through your forages, um, and through your operation, there, there are numerous ways, I apologize, I'm in an airport, if you can tell, um, numerous ways that we um, can, uh, can improve risk management tools. And then maybe the biggest piece is uh, getting adoption, uh, getting usage by our producers, and that's something that, that we intend to um, to work on too. So, uh, Donald, if you go to the next slide, I'll just quickly show you some consumer uh, information that I just think is, is interesting that we've done kind of fairly recently. So, uh, obviously, during during COVID, during what what appeared to be meat shortages, people became very very concerned about it. If you go to the next slide, um, that concern, of course, remains high. They don't necessarily have um, concerns about beef. Um, but they do are concerned about it running out um, and prices, of course, when, when they go up. So if you go to that next one, I think this is one of the interesting um, in this research, the actual willingness to pay um, has increased. Um, and so, again, that kind of um, it makes me wonder about the direct to consumer um, part of it and whether that will be around to stay, because obviously that has a higher um, higher cost uh, along with those smaller processors that might come on. Um, you know, if, if the marketplace can sustain that um, or not. So those are just a couple, a uh, couple interesting kind of how the consumer, I think, ties in here, at least what we have found in our, our post or not post COVID, but getting past the big, uh, the big wave of the first wave of COVID and what they think. So I will, I will turn it back to you, Donald, and thank you, everybody. Thanks very much, Ashley. That was um, really interesting. We have got a couple of questions that have come in, but again, I think they are questions that will appeal to or apply to all of the speakers. So I'm going to hold those to the end uh, and just recognize our time as well and move to our next speaker now. And that's uh, Fawn Jackson from the Canadian Cattlemen Association. Now, Fawn, um, I do have your slides. Do you want me to share them or do you want to share your screen? Yeah, perfect. If you don't mind, that would be great. I, I will do my best. Give me one second. Three point four. Okay. This is, uh, you know, IT was not my primary profession. So give me one second to get this. There we go. That should be it, Fawn. And if you just want to tell me to move slides for you, I can do that. Can you see that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Well, thank you so much uh, for having us today and for coordinating this um, meeting. I think it's uh, really important to have these conversations and take the lessons learned uh, forward. And, um, you know, I think what I've uh, taken from the other presenters is that there's a lot of strings um, of similarity that go through uh, all of the different industries, um, but, uh, and that these were really serious times uh, for our industry. And so certainly um, um, moving forward with uh, improved uh, practices and identifying what we've done well and what we've done, what we need to do differently 
um, I think is, is, is really important and there's lessons across the livestock uh, industry. So um, in Canada, I work um, with the Canadian Cattlemen's Association and I've been at the Global Agenda you know, a number of years ago through um, my previous role uh, and Larry Thomas is, is here uh, joining us as well. So I wanted to, uh, to point out that Larry is, is uh, here, but um, certainly, you know, COVID uh, brought a lot of interaction on the government uh, industry. You know, Liz talked about that collaboration and uh, that's what I work on now. I'm so happy to, to share that. So going on to um, the, the first slide, and uh, as Ashley had talked um, through some of the timelines, uh, certain, I think the US context is really important in the Canadian context because of how integrated uh, our, our markets are. Um, but certainly there was, um, um, you know, the Canadian context uh, as well. And uh, what we saw at the onset of uh, COVID-19, of course, was with retail um, um, really needing to, to take off to fill uh, the, the gap that was left by the food services that was um, shut down. And so we really saw a, an incredible increase at retail and food service that required some um, shifting of the supply chain. Uh, as Ashley had mentioned, um, people reached uh, to beef and uh, at times that put a lot of pressure uh, on, on the supply chain that made it difficult um, for, uh, for the supply chain to, to keep up. I would say that overall, um, it was quite successful and it really did, um, you know, keep up. I think, you know, the fears, uh, you know, perhaps the peak of fears was that there wasn't going to be uh, food on shelves and the sale of freezers shot up and, you know, all of these sorts of things. But, you know, I think there was short times of that. And then, you know, things really uh, did shake out for, um, to, to balance because beef, is relatively inelastic. Any of those small changes in, in supply certainly resulted in large changes uh, in price. And so there was price volatility. Um, and uh, you, when we look at the cost of, of uh, beef, so sales went, um, beef at retail went up 12.3% um, ground beef, which was over last year. And then sirloin steak went up 5%. So for Canadians um, that we're seeing uh, um, perhaps their incomes had um, disappeared and they were now depending on the government programs that were rolled out, you know, these are pretty significant changes. And so certainly when we're talking about food and nutrition, um, you know, undoubtedly there was impacts on, on the livelihoods of Canadians and their ability to, to pay. Um, but they did, they did reach for beef because as um, was mentioned previously, it was something that they that they knew and that they trusted. And as they were having their families around the table, that they found important to to continue to invest in. So some really interesting um, things came uh, came out of that. If we go um, on to to the next slide, I would say in terms of the timeline, you know, consumers reached for beef. We saw some challenges with moving supply between retail and food, food service. And what we were trying to plan for was um, what would happen if any of our um, any of our uh, processing plants um, went down. Uh, and right from the onset of COVID-19, that was something that the industry was working very hard on. So making sure, you know, best practices were implemented in the processing facilities, that PPE was, um, that there was enough supply, um, having, you know, temperatures, all of these sorts of things um, put in place to, to try and uh, avoid what would be a really significant impact on uh, the Canadian beef industry. From the industry's side of, from the beef producers um, side of view, what we really wanted in place, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later, uh, was a set aside program um, before something uh, did happen. And that program is something that we used during the BSE years in Canada, which essentially spreads out the number of cattle that are going for a slaughter over over a period of time by helping paying producers um, to keep those um, cattle on their operations. Unfortunately, um, we weren't able to get that program up and running um, prior to um, prior to the shutdown. So um, Harmony Beef closed on March 27th uh, to the 30th and then Cargill High River 
went to one shift on April 13th uh, and then um, did a complete closure on April 16th. And then JBS Brooks um, went to one shift on April uh, 25th and resumed their second shift on May 18th. Riding Regency, those ones are all in Western Canada and then Riding Regency in Eastern Canada um, had previously um, shut down in 2019. And so we had a large um, impact on, on Canadian uh, slaughter. So you can see by that red line um, that essentially, you know, over 70% of our, of our slaughter um, disappeared. And so um, everybody worked very, very hard. Uh, the level of collaboration, right from, you know, the people working in the plants to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency um, to, um, you know, the whole, really the whole system, I, I would have to say pulled together uh, in those, in those hard times to uh, implement um, solutions. Today, um, we think that there still are about 110,000 head of cattle that are backed up within um, the system that need to um, go for slaughter. Beef cows are, are perhaps luckier um, than you know, needing to dump milk or needing to um, uh, euthanize uh, pigs in that we are able to hold them um, within our, our system better than, I don't wanna say better, but easier um, than other livestock systems perhaps are. But undoubtedly, it's a costly endeavor for the producers uh, who who need to do that, and it and it really does need to be managed um, carefully because if you're not um, um, very mindful about that, you can uh, certainly get yourself into an animal care situation um, with animals that need to go for to slaughter um, but that aren't able to. So uh, a lot of work um, was done to to make sure that animals, for example, that really needed to go to, to slaughter were able to. So prioritization of animals, getting animals on different, um, on different feeds um, and getting those plants back up and running uh, very quickly. Certainly our um, provincial plants, um, you know, plants that were up and running really also did step up to the plate um, to um, be able to uh, help with, with slaughter. And um, today, you know, we, we have seen um, slaughter return um, very much to normal and some of those um, packing plants uh, now are also doing um, Saturday, Saturday kills um, to be able to balance that out. But going on to the next slide, um, when we were speaking with government, we were anticipating that there was going to be a half billion dollars of losses um, before, um, before June if the issue wasn't dealt with um, um, as, as we felt was, was necessary. And so um, we did have a number of programs come into place and uh, as mentioned, a lot of work done um, that did mitigate some, some of those potential uh, losses. Um, but certainly they were, were still significant. So when we look at the cumulative um, feedlot losses between mid-March and July 25th, they were, um, um, just under uh, 300 uh, million. Um, so uh, in Western Canada, um, the feedlot losses were around $314 per head on average in July, um, which uh, was around 227 in, um, in June and, and, and losing $605 a head in, in May. So there was significant losses that were felt um, at the feedlot um, level. When we go on to the next slide, um, the cow-calf operators um, did um, have it somewhat easier. There's not a lot of cattle um, that move uh, within that group um, at that time. So certainly this coming September is going to be when we're really looking to um, fully understand the implications of of the impact of COVID-19 on that portion uh, of our industry is that when that is when many of the cattle uh, will move. For this portion of the industry, though, um, the risk management programs um, were really important uh, in terms of uh, potentially not being able to utilize them. Uh, you know, in a time when it was just so evident how important these risk management programs are. So we have a, a livestock price insurance program 
and the price insurance for those programs are attached to the futures. And of course, the futures just skyrocketed um, during um, you know, those, those uh, peak times of COVID-19. Uh, fortunately, um, they did come down. So where the cost of uh, insuring a calf would have been you know, fourfold of, of what it would have been previously, uh, you know, it came down um, and, and also had some good coverage. Um, right before the deadline of um, needing to buy that coverage um, fell. They did extend um, the timeline in which you could purchase it and a couple, one of the provinces also assisted with some of the uh, increased cost of insurance because they didn't want to um, see that program um, um, go, go unused. So that was certainly a large part of, of the impact on, on that portion of the industry. Going on to the next slide, it also really uh, impacted our ability in Canada to do trade. And so our uh, imports uh, increased significantly during the time, uh, and while our exports uh, decreased significantly. We were anticipating to have a very good year on exports because of a number of the uh, trade advancements that have been made over the last number of years. Last year, our trade was up our exports were up um, just under 20%. So this was certainly a change to what we were expecting for the year. And um, what we told our trading partners was we were pleased that beef was able to um, stay on the shelf. Um, but of course now uh, you know, it's back to uh, competition and uh, getting Canadians um, um, back to, to some Canadian beef. But, um, you know, I think the lesson that needs to come from the international trading system is that it worked. Um, when shifts needed to be made, um, they, they were made and we were um, very agile. And you know, I think some people are taking away from COVID-19 that, that we really need to focus on some of these um, um, more local, local systems. And you know, I think that diversification is very important, um, but I think we also must be very careful not to um, to over or in, uh, incorrectly interpret um, what happened in the global um, um, trade of, of meat. Going on to the next slide, there was um, a number of actions um, that were taken that I think really um, helped avoid uh, larger um, disruptions. Um, there was early recognition that agriculture was an essential service. I know that's something that's happened, you know, in many parts of the world. There was a, an enormous amount of collaboration of um, establishments of things for um, PPEs, uh, for example, industry government uh, uh, collaboration, um, Canada, international collaboration, Canada, US, you know, really making the commitment um, that although we might be closing our border to uh, tourism and non-discretionary um, um, travel um, it, that, that that international trade would uh, continue. So I think that there were a lot of things um, that were done that supported the successful adaptation in agriculture um, to the realities of COVID-19. Going into the next slide, um, certainly, uh, you know, a number of programs that were announced specific for agriculture um, so as I mentioned, the livestock price insurance, which is particularly important for young producers, um, it, the prices for it came down and one of the provinces in Canada chose to help support some of the premiums um, with that. We reestablished the set aside program. So that program um, that I mentioned earlier that helps producers um, set a, a pen of cattle uh, aside and not send them to market for a set period of time and then they um, are, are paid to, to keep those, those cattle. Um, and, and that was a program that we used during BSC successfully. So it, it got up and running relatively uh, quickly and we certainly have it in place uh, if there is a second, a second wave. Um, there was increased lending capacity. There was funding that was given to um, processing facilities um, to help them make some of the adaptations. So um, there was, there was uh, significant investments that were made to, to um, help advance um, the adaptation. But then there was also, so those are agriculture specific. Going on to the next slide, there was also federal programs to help um, Canadians in general 
um, adapt to, to COVID-19. So things like there was an emergency business account where um, a company could um, borrow $40,000 40, uh, loan and have zero interest and are partially forgivable um, if uh, repaid within a set timeline. There was a wage subsidy um, for businesses who had suffered, suffered um, a drop in gross revenue. There was um, the uh, financial support to employed and self-employed in Canadians up to um, $500 a week. Um, and that program is going to um, end here in September. And then there was also a surplus food purchase program that was also announced um, to help both the Canadians in need, as well as help industry, um, those industries, you know, thinking of things like um, potatoes to um, help deal with some of the, the excess that exists. Going on to my second last slide, um, Something that um, happened uh, in Canada is certainly the conservation community um, did talk about their concern of uh, the impact, the, the impact that they understood or know happened um, following BSC, which was the last, you know, really large economic shock to um, the Canadian beef industry. And, and after that, we had 26,917 ranching operations exit the Canadian um, beef industry. And when they did that, um, we lost 5 million acres of grasslands. And in Canada, our grasslands are one of the most endangered ecosystems. Um, and depending on the province that you're in, but overall, uh, less than 20% of them uh, remain. And if you're looking at the sh uh, tall grass prairie, you know, it's around one to 2%. So um, it, conservation organizations um, also expressed their concern of what would happen if inaction um, was taken by the federal government, not only on, on you know, the Canadian um, um, beef system, but what would happen on the, um, on the environmental front. So that could have some very serious implications. So um, I would say that they joined um, the beef industry in um, communicating what, what, what we might see as would happen uh, in, in the future. And certainly we were also very concerned about our young producers, um, their ability to survive the economic shocks as compared to somebody who is um, more established uh, in their career or in their farm um, um, was certainly a concern. And I want to say that this also came out of, a, out of the lessons from BSC, as um, we know that the people who left the industry at that time were the young producers. Um, they were, you know, the older producers who were going to get out anyway, and then we really lost a generation of, of farmers. So when we were talking about um, what programs we wanted to see at the federal level, we certainly focused on things such as livestock price insurance, because we know that that program is is particularly important for that age demographic. So with that, um, I, will, I will hand it back over to you, Donald, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul. That was really interesting to get the Canadian perspective contrasted with the US. Um, again, there have been a number of questions that have come in. Um, there's one that I want to handle now, if, you, if that's okay with you. The rest of them, I think, relate more to um, the general discussion we're going to have at the end. And so the one that came in is from Tim Hardman from um, WWF. He was just asking, how do the economics to the BSE shock compare to the economics of COVID in Canada? Yeah, Tim, that's a great question. Um, why don't I dig up some further detail here while the others are presenting and I'll have an answer to you. You're telling me, Fawn, you're not going to listen to Doug Blade from Dairy Farms in America. I am. I'm going to send messages in the back, and we'll uh, we'll get the we'll get the question answered, and we'll listen. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation, Fawn. So that brings me to our next presenter um, for today. So we move from the producers to the processor manufacturing side, and we've got Doug Blade, um, who I mentioned before, EVP from Dairy Farms of America. Doug, I know I've got some slides from you. Do you want me to share them or do you want to share your screen? Which way works best for you? Yeah, Donald, thank you. If you wouldn't mind, uh, it'd be great if you could advance them for me. Um, sure. If thank I think you. about, uh, I'll spend the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, um, you know, really trying to provide a, a perspective, as you said, from the processor side. Uh, Paul from National Milk um, did a excellent job providing an informed and accurate 
view across not just the dairy industry, but also from a farmer standpoint, processors and consumers. So um, the other presenters have also done a nice job talking about the differences that we've experienced on the channels of trade between retail and food service. So I'm going to choose not to be overly redundant in that, and I'll get through this hopefully relatively quickly. I thought I'd start, though, many of you may not even be aware of who is Dairy Farmers of America. So I've got a few slides just to orient you to who is DFA. Uh, if you'd go to the next slide, please, Donald. So uh, DFA is a uh, cooperative. It's the largest supplier of raw milk in the world. Um, we market about 60 billion gallons of, 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 uh, of milk from both our own members as well as some other members across the United States. We're headquartered in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, and we are owned by dairy farmers. Uh, next slide, please. To give you a sense of uh, who, who are our products and what are our products, we have a very diverse product portfolio. We have four primary business units. Um, we've got uh, uh, the milk marketing and farm services side that's closest to our membership. Uh, we've got uh, a rather large uh, scale now branded retail business with the recent acquisition of Dean Foods completed earlier this year. We've got uh, a several billion dollar global ingredients business. And we also have a, a beverage division that is the largest uh, producer of aseptic and retort uh, products in the United States. In total, that's about 87 facilities across the U.S. And uh, as reported by Rabobank, we are now the uh, third largest dairy company in the world. Uh, it's uh, slightly over $20 billion uh, if you annualized our Dean acquisition in 2019 sales. And we're the third, um, third largest, as I said, uh, globally when you just purely look at, uh, at dairy sales. Next slide. Uh, our mission uh, is, is really committed to um, delivering value to our family farm owners. And, and that's really what the role of a cooperative exists to do. We run, really want to allow our membership to focus on taking care of the animals, taking care of their farms, and then in turn, they entrust us to take that product and further process it to deliver value to the marketplace, which then to our next slide, Donald, is our, is our vision. Our vision is to enrich communities and consumers' lives through all the possibilities of dairy. And that's our charge. Uh, so next slide, I think, is gonna give us uh, um, our, our values. That as we think about engaging and operating, both with our employee base, but also with our customers and consumers around the planet, we wanna recognize we have a responsibility to operate with integrity, to deliver quality in everything that we do, and to live out the passion of delivering the goodness of dairy. But we also recognize that we have responsibility to our communities, our community of employees, our community of farm families, the communities where our farmers and our facilities and our employees live and work, but also to the community of consumers across the planet that rely on us to deliver high quality goods and services and do so in a responsible and sustainable manner. Next slide, please. This just gives you a perspective on, um, we are a, a national footprint. So the, this is just a, a glimpse of our farms across the country. We represent 8,000 farms and 14,000 families across the US. Next slide. And you'll see these are our wholly owned manufacturing facilities that are both in close proximity to consumers, the density of consumers on the east and the west, but also close to our 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 manufacturing facilities are close to our, process, our, our, our farm producers. Next slide. And this is just a glimpse of some of our brands. We view um, our business as a collection of local and regional brands that represent uh, the sustainability and transparency of farm to fork, as is said, in the United States. Okay, next please. All right, now I think what I'd like to do, um, again, not to be redundant messages, I think all the speakers have done a nice job talking about the marketplace challenges, but given the diversity of our businesses, maybe I'll give you a, a quick glimpse over the next several minutes as to how each one of those four business units of milk marketing, farm services, branded retail, ingredient solutions, and beverages have encountered some of the challenges related to the pandemic. As a farmer-owned cooperative, the most significant responsibility we have every day is to pick up our farmer's milk and ensure that this amazing, amazing food source is further processed within 72 hours. 
a very short shelf life uh, to determine what are we going to do um, with that good product. And given the significant swings that have been talked about across the demand in food service and retail, the logistics related to that uh, has probably been one of our most significant undertakings. Um, but quick action by the industry, uh, by the government, by the, co the partnership of co-ops that go across the industry and with processors, with the focus on uh, joint macro and micro solutions was an unprecedented in any industry that I've been a part of. And I might add, it was very effective. From the federal food box program to uh, farmers feeding family programs, we were able to provide the goodness of dairy to families in need that were impacted, not of their own, not just by schools closing, not just by businesses pausing, not just by restaurants not being able to serve in dining, but many people lost their jobs as a result, result of the pandemic, and they needed that source of nutrition. They needed uh, it available to them. And so I, I, I think there was excellent collaboration across the industry uh, to meet those needs. Uh, there has also been a lot of dialogue across the other industry groups on the benefit of risk management tools. And, and I'll also give a plug that from a processor standpoint, as we talked with customers, as a cooperative, as we engage with our farmer owners, um, yes, it is useful to be in a reactive mode of trying to respond to risk management tools once you're in the crisis, but more importantly is being proactive and having a risk management strategy that can allow you to deal with these unanticipated uh, challenges that we encounter uh, as, a, as a citizens of this, uh, of this world, but to also as business people operating around. And I think each cooperative and each industry in their own way had to lean into base excess programs as a means of balancing the change in demand with supply. And, and again, just a large shout out to a, a, lot, a lot of the industry groups and a lot of the businesses working collaboratively focused on solutions. Um, one of our other big challenges was completing a, a multi-billion dollar acquisition that consisted of uh, about 50 manufacturing facilities, 12,000 employees, and a dozen new brands during a pandemic. Um, you know, that required us to really lean in and leverage technology heavily uh, and to be focused on, uh, on listening to people that were closest to the, to, to the challenges and the opportunities ahead. So I, I'm not gonna go into too much, at least in my segment, on what were the challenges with the swings in demand in retail. I think a lot of the other presenters have already covered that. Our ingredients business, uh, again, very heavily impacted by the impact on restaurants, the impact on stay-at-home orders. Um, as one of the speakers highlighted, the good news in this is consumers were forced to slow down in this stay-at-home environment. Families returned to having meals together. They were began baking and cooking again. Dramatic increase in consuming the goodness of dairy several times a day. Um, but the challenges is as processors operate on thin margins, many of these segments have become commoditized over the years. And as a result, there's limited excess capacity to meet these big changes in demand. Uh, a lot of processors are focused on servicing a specific channel of trade. So while we saw the big increase in retail, a lot of that is packaging driven. Um, and, and there was not excess capacity to meet that due demand. Food service is also very packaging centric. And a lot of the processing capacity suddenly had a lot more available capacity, but that wasn't transferable in a quick manner to retail ready. So this is another example again of where customers and the retail trade, processors um, and industry groups work together to try to, to focus on solutions. And that was quite helpful. Uh, if we look at our beverage division, as I mentioned, we're the largest manufacturer of aseptic and retort products in the U.S., and we primarily to produce products for other people's brands. Think about the, the retail frappuccino that you see that's this Starbucks branded. DFA is, is the largest producer of that for them. If you think of this Tostitos branded salsa and queso, DFA is the largest producer for free Lily PepsiCo of those products. And even Nestle Coffee Mate, um, the, the coffee creamer, DFA is their largest partner in producing those items. We also, also saw various swings, not just in channels of trade, but in package, package sizes and in consumer preferences. And if you think about it, this shift from people being on the go and the busy lifestyles that occurred 
um, once the stay at home orders came into place, all of that took a big pause. And as a result of that, not only were retail purchases impact, but the package sizes that people were buying was impacted as well. People were shifting from their, their, their desire for on the go in the smaller serving sizes to much more uh, of, of value packaged products, which had a narrowing focus on sizes and a narrowing focus on varieties and choices. You might have noticed some of your favorite products. Um, there are fewer SKUs available while uh, processors try to increase overall capacity by reducing changeovers. So in my last couple of minutes, Donald, I think I'd probably rather focus on what have been some of our key learnings that we've really tried to embrace and practice as a result of working through all of these challenging times. Um, as I referenced earlier, and many of the prior speakers have talked about, there's true benefit in having strong and established relationships and having open communication channels with employees, with customers, and with industry and government partners. If you find yourself in the crisis and the pandemic that we did trying to build those relationships, that's gonna be a tough time to do that. But if you can um, leverage those relationships that you've spent years building um, and you've already established trust, you've already established um, ways of working, you've demonstrated through your history of living out values of integrity, quality, passion, um, and community. Um, you're, you're really able to get a lot of work done quickly. Uh, and, and I think the other element that we're actually living out now that I call a key learning was embrace technology. Equip your teams and communicate, communicate, communicate. We began having uh, weekly town hall sessions across all of our different teams where they were virtual meetings. And um, we also got into a practice of uh, get, getting a lot of survey feedback on, are you getting enough information in this re remote work environment to effectively do your jobs? Obviously, our manufacturing teams and our logistics teams, uh, they, they didn't have that option to stay at home, but a lot of our support functions did. And what we learned from that is by embracing technology, equipping teams, and communicate, 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 Largely, the transactional work is being done very efficiently working remotely. But as a society, uh, as a corporate governance group, we must now recognize that we've also got to provide solutions for relational connections. And technology can only go so far in doing that. But I think we've also now got to take a look to recognize some of these are not going to be temporary solutions. And we need to really begin to, to lean into how do we lead more effectively teams? How do we lead people with those relational connections um, going forward? Uh, the, the, the third key learning I, I would share is that to support and embrace a culture and attitude of solutions. And you might say, well, isn't that natural? Well, I, I think when people get scared, when there's a lot of ambiguity, they tend to focus on the problems. And what I've seen this industry do, what I've seen our businesses do, what I've seen our farmers do with customers and consumers is to collaborate together with a focus on can do and solutions. Uh, and, and that is such a more healthy, productive and outcome focused approach that, that I think a lot of organizations are feeling. Related to that, uh, the, the fourth key learning I, sh I would share is incorporate the ideas of, other, of those that are closest to the work. Um, whether that's employees, customers, the industry, or government partners, by bringing those folks that are closest to the work together and giving them the opportunity to deliver the solve, to deliver the solution, and then support them in doing that, boy, that's some powerful improvement that'll be sustainable improvement, not just a quick fix. And lastly, which I think is really the essence behind this forum, learn from others. Right, recognize that there's so much more to learn, so much more we can do by engaging with each other, uh, by, by, by focusing on outcomes, by focusing on the greater good. It's not just a mantra. Uh, it's something that as leaders we need to put into practice. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll pause and say thank you, Donald. Thanks for those that are, that are dialing in uh, and uh, look forward to the rest of the agenda. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Doug. And um, there are a couple of questions that I think fit for you, but we're going to bring them in at the end during our uh, general Q&A session and we'll keep moving at this point. 
So thank you for that. We now move on to hear from the views in the NGO community. And the first speaker for us is Timothy Hardman. Uh, Timothy is with WWF. And Timothy, I believe you're just going to share some thoughts with us. Uh, there's no presentation. Yeah, that's right, Donald. And thank you uh, for even allowing us to be part of this. Um, and I do apologize that uh, that you don't get to see my animation while we're on this. I'm, I'm about 90 miles south of DFA on the Kansas side and their, their internet connections don't reach all the way down here in rural Kansas. So, um, but you know, our, what I'm gonna talk about is gonna be a shifting of gears of sorts because what WWF has experienced through this and our experience through this has been different than what you've heard before. And, and it's been really, really good to hear the industry perspective and, and, and how there's been disruptions and things like that. And WWF and I think the world of con conservation thinks about this a little bit differently. Um, and recognizing the, the hardships that have, have happened through the industries. Um, you know, our science team, our global science team has, has dug into this a little bit. And so what I'm gonna present or, or talk about is, are some of those findings and, and some of our takes on some of those findings. And by no means is, is what I'm gonna talk about to be seen as a silver bullet because there's, there is no silver bullet to, to overcoming this um, and to, to um, lessen our chances at future outbreaks. So, um, what we did see is that the zoonotic diseases that have been emerging in people can demonstrate how human health, human health and nature are very closely related. Um, our interactions with nature as people expose us to or have chances to expose us to a wide range of, of disease. Um, you know, over the past several decades, about 60 to 70% of new diseases that emerged in humans had a zoonotic origin. And those pathogens can affect us through, through direct contact with wild animals or th that are the natural carriers or indirectly through an intermediate host like a domestic animal or, or livestock that live close to us. Um, we think that, that healthy ecosystems can help mitigate our exposure and our vulnerability to these different health risks and, and that robust natural ecosystems can provide access to the necessities that we have like clean air and clean water and food, which all help to, to strengthen and strengthen our health and our, our immune systems. And when natural ecosystems remain intact, interactions between these major human population groups and wild host species are, are often more limited. And as a result of that, viruses can circulate in natural ecosystems without crossover into humans. Um, the increase in zoonotic outbreaks could be a system of a broken relationship between us as humans and nature. And we think they may get worse as population growth and population pressures increase and people increasingly move um, out into these natural ecosystems, resulting in increased contact between humans and wildlife or, or wildlife and domestic animals and livestock. And this of course would result in, in additional exposures to some new pathogens and create dangerous conditions for spillover from one species to another. And we, we really believe that there are two main drivers that have accelerated, not, not that are, are solely responsible, but that have, have helped accelerate the risks of these outbreaks. And, and one, the first one, is the illegal and high risk trade and consumption of wildlife. Uh, global sales of, of wildlife animals and their meat and other products have increased human contact with wild species and thus increasing exposure. And we've seen the demand for wild meat really growing around the globe. And, and in some regions, people consume uh, wild meat products because it's considered a delicacy or, or a status symbol um, or simply out of curiosity. Um, 
it's also consumed as a source of protein in in some regions, particularly in rural communities and in, in developing countries, exposing individuals to, you know, potentially exposing individuals to dangerous pathogens. And, and there could be some, uh, some issues with following the same food safety standards, you know, with the hunting and transportation and cooking of, of wild animals. The second driver, um, that we see is the unsustainable food or is an unsustainable food system that is driving large scale conversion for agricultural land and land conversion for food and livestock production is, is destroying and fragmenting natural habitats around the world. The amount of land that's being converted is increasing quickly as we try to feed a, glo a, a growing global population and most of this, um, most of the losses of, of primary forest and grassland is, can be attributed to agriculture and really to three commodities and that's beef, soy, and palm oil. And this widespread land conversion can have severe consequences. The, these natural ecosystems are extremely rich in biodiversity and really play important roles in in carbon sequestration and storage, and they're often uh, major water sources for people. And that conversion and, and fragmentation of natural habitat, they're, they're not only, um, not only can they be catastrophic to the ecosystem health, but also in, increase these possible interactions between humans and wildlife. And so, We've looked at this crisis as, as potentially a pivotal moment in where we can take action and, and really by addressing these key drivers of the illegal, illegal and high risk wildlife trade and increasing the sustainability of our, of our food systems, um, really looking at you know, eliminating that conversion and fragmentation from the supply chains and and, and help reduce the impact in, of environmental drivers on human health. And so, you know, we think that this is a good time for us to, to help support changes that can protect not only the health of, of the planet, but the health of people over the long term as well. And, and to do that, again, I, I've talked about the the high risk wildlife trade and consumption, it really stopping that and shutting down the trade and sale of high risk wildlife mark within markets and, and enforce these hygienic and, and food safety practices across markets. But not only by that, but, but there's a, a certain amount of the population that relies on this trade and this consumption as, as, as their livelihoods and their subsistence. And so also, um, developing sustainable and, and resilient business opportunities to support those people who rely on that on that outlet as a, as a source of protein or income. And then looking at um, supporting the sustainable food system that, that really stops the encroachment on nature and, and reinforcing government's efforts to maintain environmental protections and to protect funding for environmental programs uh, in, including, you know, the effective management of protected and conserved areas. We need to, um, to maintain and strengthen voluntary measures from private sector to eliminate conversion from our supply chains. And so there's, there's something that we've been talking about as WWF and I, I hope it's starting to gain traction a little bit, but that's the commitment to a new deal for people in nature. Um, that provides nature positivity in the world by 2030. And, and it really includes three goals. And the first one is to protect and restore natural habitats. So that meaning securing the world's remaining natural spaces. And so by protecting 30% of the land and ocean and sustainably managing the rest and really applying emphasis on community led conservation and sustainable management there. Uh, the second is safeguarding the diversity of life. 
and so halt the extinction, the rate of extinction, and the, the sharp decline of wildlife populations by protecting and restoring habitats. And then the third is by having the halving, the footprint of production and consumption and reducing the negative impacts by addressing the main economic drivers of natural ecosystem loss. And, and, and we've got those as, you know, and, and the consumption piece, I wanna think about all consumption and not just food consumption because um, there's certainly fragmentation and, and conversion due to these other industries, but agriculture, fishing, infrastructure development, um, extracting, extractive industries, forestry and, and energy production. Um, and, and I'll kind of just stop there, Donald. I, I do just want to say, you know, there's not a silver bullet in this. Um, and, and we are looking at it in a, in a different, from a different lens, simply because of the world we live in versus the world that you live in being very, um, very affected in a short amount of time with this. Uh, we've had time to think about this and, and those are some of our thoughts. Well, thank you, Tim. We certainly appreciate it. And I think it's important that we recognize that we need all perspectives at the table if we're going to make a, a change in our global food system. So appreciate your sharing your, your perspective with us. And we're going to move on to Esben uh, Larson now. Esben's a fellow in the food program at the World Resources Institute. You'll have an opportunity to ask Tim uh, questions at the end as well. And Fawn, given Tim asked you a question, I think it would be uh, appropriate for you to line one up for him for during the Q&A session. So um, I expect Esben, it. <laughs> Good. Esmond, can I uh, invite you? I, I think, again, you're just going to talk, no slides. Is that correct? Great. So, Esmond, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Donald, and thank you for inviting, also for all the interesting intervention we've heard of until now. I promised uh, Donald just to say a few words about the World Resources Institute. So we are a global think tank, do tank, with uh, 1,200 employees doing research, policy impact, um, engagement with the uh, governments, the largest uh, companies around the world. We have 11 uh, offices spread out over the world. Uh, and it's within seven main areas. So food, forest, and water. Uh, it's energy, climate, sustainable uh, cities, um, and then the ocean. So that's the, the realm we, we are working in. And then um, I will try to give a global perspective with anchors into the American situation. And uh, I'm from a family farm myself back in Denmark, where we produce around 30,000 pigs annually. So I can clearly understand the pressure that uh, we have just heard described, even though the situation in Denmark has been uh, very, very different than uh, from here. But I really understand how this has uh, played out. So according to uh, FAO, both the lives and livelihoods are at risk from the pandemic. Unless we take uh, immediate action, we risk a, a global food emergency that could have long-term impacts on hundreds of millions of children and adults. Of course, the global south, the developing world, is the most vulnerable. But also here in the West, here in the US, we have seen how livelihoods are hit and it's been very uh, clearly described through some of the interventions today. In the developing world, this is due mostly to a lack of access to food as incomes fall, uh, re uh, remittances are lost, and to some extent, uh, food prices rise. In countries already affected by high levels of acute food insecurity, uh, it's no longer a food access issue alone, but increasingly a food production issue, something we have seen also here in the US. COVID-19 has struck at a time when hunger and malnourishment keeps rising. According to the latest UN estimates, at a minimum, an additional 83 million people, which resembles the population in California, Texas, and Florida, may go hungry in 2020 as a result of the economic recession triggered by the pandemic. 
This would be in addition to the 690 million people going hungry already, so two times America's population. At the same time, 135 million suffer from acute food insecurity and in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. So this is a problem, this is a pandemic with long-term consequences. According to the World Bank, the pandemic's economic impact could push about 100 million people into extreme poverty. So to avert a food emergency, there's an urgent need to protect the most vulnerable, keep global food supply chains alive, mitigate the pandemic's impact across the food system, protect and even ramp up food production as much as possible, and looking beyond the pandemic, building back better, more resilient food systems, as we also just heard from the WWF. So the pandemic has been impacting the livestock sector globally due to reduced access to animal feed, due to drought, for example, as Ashley McDonald also mentioned. But also slaughterhouses diminished capacity to the, due to the logistical constraints and labor shortage. We have seen examples of that in China, in Germany, and also here in the US, as Liz Wackstrom described. In countries already affected by other crises, emerging evidence from FAO's assessments highlights the livestock sector is particularly vulnerable to the effects of the pandemic. At the onset of the COVID-19 outbreak, there has been a significant increase in demand. Production and demand vary across major food commodities. For example, in spite of uncertainties posed by the pandemic, FAO's first forecast for the 2020-2021 season point to a comfortable cereal supply and demand situation. World's uh, total meat production, on the other hand, is forecast to fall by 1.7% in 2020 due to animal diseases, COVID-19 related market disruptions, and the lingering effects of droughts. And as we heard from the pork side, when 2 million animals are unaccounted for, well, they will be missed in the production line uh, downstream. Overall, food markets will face many more months of uncertainty due to COVID-19 and more longer term, according to the OECD and FAO's Agricultural Outlook 2020 to 2029, the pandemic is expected to depress demand in the next few years and could further undermine food security. So what have we seen of negative consequences due to COVID-19 in the US? Yeah, we have already heard some of it. According to the International Dairy Foods Association, in April, about 5% of the country's milk supply was being dumped. And that amount was expected to double. As we have heard today, farming groups uh, to prevent further dumping has been trying to find places to send excess milk but there are logistical obstacles that prevent dairy products from being shifted neatly from food service customers to retailers. And that is due to the structure in agriculture and the food service sector here in the US. According to the USDA, the food service industry is nearly equal in size to food retailing. And of course that challenges the easiness of redistribution and the direct production between pharma and food service sector. This is a very unique to any other developed country in the world. Why we have seen the consequences also described today from the dairy industry, pork industry, and so on. In the country I was born in, Denmark, a small country, 5.7 million citizens, with a completely different, ba different balance between home cooked food and food service. The largest dairy, Ala Foods, has been able to redistribute its milk to the retail sector avoiding massive food waste and been able to continue its production, even though the rest of society was under shutdown. One of the causes to this development with the food consumption in Denmark is really that gains on average at home, they eat at home. So the shutdown of the food service sector has not been that fatal in regard to food production. Just one number that illustrates this. 98% of Danish families with children eat their evening meal at home. 
So this, of course, illustrates a difference. As talked about, we have seen the shutdown of meat processing plants here in the US. Luckily, the newest USDA numbers show that capacity utilization in the US pork processing industry is on the rebound as workers and plants earlier infected by COVID-19 recover and return to work. All reactions to the situation that was difficult to predict, but that needs to teach us a lesson in regard to the structural flexibility within food and ag production in the US for the future. And that needs a really thorough discussion on how food is produced and redistributed and how it can be done in a more sustainable manner. Part of the Trump administration's plan to bail out farmers includes the government buying of 3 billion to buy some of that produce that would have been wasted. The challenge with that is of course setting up distribution chains and having food banks that are able to process free, fresh produce. During the first four months of the pandemic, a group of friends and I, we handed out meals to around 200 homeless every day around noon. And it was food sponsored by the uh, DC government. And it's not that easy just to fit in fresh produce in uh, packaged meal boxes that goes after a certain setup. So that's of course some of the challenges uh, of this whole redistribution of fresh produce. So what has then been done to improve the situation? Well, globally, governments have already committed an unprecedented 10 trillion US dollars in fiscal stimulus to combat the pandemic driven economic downturn. Three times the amount committed in response to the 28, 29 financial crisis to restart markets, which of course will benefit food producers, restart that can harm the environment if not done well. More is expected as governments shift from emergency spending to recovery investments. About 30% of the announced fiscal stimulus is being directed to sectors with high environmental impact. Vivid Economics uh, found that in 14 out of 18 countries, spending that could negatively impact the environment outweighs the positive. Another study by 14 research groups on the energy sector found that only six of the G20 nations are committing more public money to clean energy than to polluting sectors. Some emerging responses are greener than others. The European Commission's 826 billion US dollars stimulus proposal would set aside 25% for climate friendly investments and includes a 45 billion US dollars just trans transition fund to help vulnerable regions uh, cut reliance on fossil fuels, but also assist farmers with, uh, within the rural development program where countries can allocate up to 1% of the rural development budget to support farmers with direct payments. The package will follow the principle of doing no harm which uh, theoretically would exclude fossil fuel investments, although this is not done, no, it's not yet done, uh, a, a yet done deal, sorry. At the other end of the spectrum, the United States has announced around uh, $3 trillion in, dollars in fiscal support, the most of any country with zero consideration to sustainability. Indeed, the package has provided tailored targeted relief to oil and gas companies, uh, though not to the oil and gas workers. On April 17, the US Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, announced, which many of you of course know, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Uh, this is uh, an interesting program, uh, and we heard some of the details by uh, Paul Bleiber. Uh, how it will work, how it will support a sustainable development in the long run for American farmers will of course uh, be yet to, sh to show. Elsewhere, the picture is mixed. Uh, the Republic of Korea has announced a 10.5 billion in green spending. India is one of several countries to support nature-based solutions, spending about $800 million. Uh, we have seen China spending on uh, grid enhancements, on rail upgrades, uh, but also just launched a uh, 
program to fight food waste because they, of course, know that the pandemic has uh, severe damage to food security in, in, in general. The stimulus packages, the recovery initiatives, uh, must focus on creating more just, sustainable and resilient food systems. One thing is the short-term investments, another is the long-term structural changes that has also been called upon today. We live in a world where, according to WHO, 2 billion people are overweight or obese, while 500 million people are malnourished. 820 million are suffering from starvation. At the same time, one third of all food in the world is either lost or wasted. And if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest emitter of CO2. And here in the, here in the US alone, 40% of all food is never eaten. At the same time, people starve, starve, and that dreadful situation must be changed with a firm view on sustainable food systems that cares more for nature, environment, sustainability, and people being more resilient in the future. So situations like the pandemic can be hopefully avoided or less impactful on the lives of people, especially the vulnerable ones. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esben. Very interesting. Now, Esben, you were very modest in your introduction of yourself. You were, of course, the Minister for, uh, I think, Agriculture and the Environment in Denmark as part of the government there, but also you were recently appointed to a Vatican committee. Could you maybe just take one moment and tell us about the committee that you were appointed to? Because I think that relates to COVID as well. I'm just not 100% sure of the detail. Well, that's right. I was uh, appointed to be a part of uh, His Holiness the Pope's COVID commissions, where we advise the Pope and the Holy See on their COVID response, both internally in the church, but also externally to the world. And uh, with 1.2 billion Catholics, uh, it's of course um, a major player in regards to trying to change the world to be more just and more sustainable. So uh, I've been doing that for now, I think five months or six months. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for your comments today, Esben. And uh, again, there will be uh, time for questions and answers at the end. Um, our next speaker though, we will keep moving, is Alec Rinkus. Alex is with um, Health for Animals. And Alex, do you want me to play your presentation or will you share your screen? Uh, no, I should be able to share my screen. Let me give it a quick Fantastic. try. You, you'll, you'll stop challenging my IT skills. <laughs> I don't know if mine are any better, but hopefully it's, it's sharing now. It is. Thank you, sir. Perfect. So let me just get this started. Okay. I see we're a couple minutes behind, so I'll do my best to, to try to do this in a timely manner. Um, for those who have not met me before, uh, my name is Alex Rinkus. I'm with uh, Health for Animals. And for those who are not familiar with Health for Animals, we are the global representatives of the animal health sector. So our members are manufacturers of veterinary pharmaceuticals, vaccines, diagnostics, nutritional products, antibiotics, et cetera. Basically anything used by you know, veterinarians, farmers, pet owners around the health, for, um, the health of animals. Certainly you'll recognize uh, many of our members, uh, some of the big global companies like Merck, Zoitis, Barnard Ingelheim, et cetera. Um, roughly combined, our membership represents approximately 85 to 90% of that global animal health market. Now, Health for Animals, uh, we are based in Brussels, Belgium, although I work out of Washington, D.C. Um, we are a relatively small organization, only a headcount of four, um, but underneath us, we do have a network of associations in uh, many areas of the globe. So folks here in the U.S., uh, you may be familiar with our U.S. association, um, AHI, the Animal Health Institute, um, up in Canada, CAHI, the Canadian Animal Health Institute, uh, Europe, the uh, Animal Health Europe there, as well as associations in you know, Australia, Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, et cetera, really across the globe, um, which gives Health for Animals a really nice sort of international perspective on uh, what's happening in this space, you know, what's been happening with COVID and really some of the, the impacts we've seen around the world. 
I won't labor the point too much. I, I think the speakers already uh, made it quite clear that, you know, we saw in, in March and April and May just an, an absolutely unprecedented crisis, um, you know, something that really, uh, I think, caught, you know, most set industries on the back foot, really caught the world on the back foot, most governments, et cetera, um, and really sent a, a lot of folks scrambling, um, ourselves included. But, you know, after the, the scope of this crisis became clear, you know, our members, our goal was really homing in on, on what's always been our core focus. So our customers, their animals, and our employees. So, you know, our members began to ask themselves, you know, how do we need to adapt in order to support our customers, you know, deliver them the products that they need to preserve the health of their animals um, during these unprecedented times. But then also, you know, how do we support our employees and really that wider community around us? You know, I think a lot of sectors talk about CSR and, and uh, you know, those societal actions, but, you know, COVID was the opportunity to folks to, for folks to really put action to those words. So first and foremost, you know, our sector is a, a manufacturing sector. Um, you know, we rely on our factories and facilities for producing our products, you know, for getting them out the door, getting them to those customers. Um, so our, you know, first priority was really maintaining those operations. So um, how do we protect our employees? How do we ensure that they can do their, continue their jobs as they are essential employees and do it in the safest way possible that limits any spread of, of COVID-19 in communities? So you saw many of our, of our members adopting policies like, you know, staggering work schedules, you know, adding ventilation to facilities, sanitation stations, you know, just spreading people out more, you know, whatever could be done to really accommodate this new sort of socially distanced world and one in which, you know, we want to keep um, our folks really as, as safe as possible during this so we can continue to get those animal health products to those folks on the ground. Um, and in addition, you know, we recognize that that our companies are, you know, we're not islands. Um, we are part of larger communities around us. You know, it's where our employees spend the majority of their lives. Um, you know, it's where they spend two thirds of their day when they are not in 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 work. And so we want to see how we can help there. You know, for instance, a few of our companies are based in in the New York City area. And during that March, April time period, you know, it was their employees who were really seeing, you know, the impacts of COVID in, in real time in that city and seeing uh, sort of some of those harrowing scenes when uh, confusion was at its highest. So you saw many of our members, you know, reconfiguring some of their factories to produce sanitizers when we were experiencing those short shortages. Um, you know, auditing protection, protective equipment that they had on hand to see what could be donated to, you know, local hospitals and, and local frontline workers. Um, for those companies that did have human health divisions as well, you know, you saw them allowing folks with medical background to take paid leave so that they could, you know, support hospitals, get on those front lines and, and really help with that initial um, pandemic response. So we're proud to, to definitely do that type of community support. Again, you know, it all really comes back to our core customers as well. Um, you know, we can produce as many of these, you know, medicines and, and products as we want, but if we can't get it into the hands of our customers, if we can't get it to veterinarians, can't get it to farmers, can't get it to pet owners, you know, then those animals are going to, to suffer. You know, we are gonna see those, um, those negative repercussions. So, you know, first and foremost, our, our goal was to, you know, secure that essential status that we saw from medicines and veterinarians and in major markets, um, really making sure that medicines could continue to cross borders, um, could continue to get to farms so that, you know, those, those, uh, those folks there could continue to provide the care that that animals needed. Um, many of our members looked at, you know, how can they strengthen their supply chains? Um, you know, you'll recall at that time there was talks of certain countries, you know, blocking exports of raw materials, things of that nature. So we wanted to make sure we could continue a steady supply of, of products, you know, no matter what happened. Um, and then again, you know, as many folks here said today, really just open communication and collaboration with uh, with authorities and partners. You know, we were all dealing with uh, things as they came at us um, and really trying to react in, in real time. And so, you know, keeping that close communications with, uh, with our partners was key there. Um, you know, I remember even when we were back getting those kind of daily calls and, and contacts from governments as they were sort of making policies on the fly and, and making sure that, you know, those would, uh, would work for for those folks on the ground and we were happy to see you know despite 
all the conversation I think we've seen around, um, you know, some of the challenges of globalization, global supply chains, et cetera, at least in the veterinary medicine space, we experience no shortages in any major markets, um, which you know, I think is a testament to the wider sector and really the, the collaboration that we see in that uh, livestock sector as well. But also, you know, outside of, you know, just, uh, just sort of the products that we are trying to get out there and, and the support we're trying to provide for our, our customers in that sense, you know, we saw other issues cropping up. Um, you know, I think the, the speakers earlier today made quite clear, you know, during that March, and April and May time period, you know, producers had their hands full to say the least. Um, you know, again, an unprecedented crisis that was absorbing all of the time out there and, and more. And we began to see, you know, I think some folks trying to take advantage of that opportunity, using it as a chance to, um, you know, put unscientific and unfounded attacks up there around livestock um, at a time in which it was quite difficult for, for folks to respond. Um, you know, namely, we did see a number of organizations trying to make claims that, you know, somehow COVID was caused by livestock or livestock was the source of, of COVID-19, um, you know, to the point where we even saw some politicians saying this, you know, for instance, the EU uh, commissioner for the environment had brought that up at one point, which was quite worrying because obviously that has you know no basis in in reality. So, you know, we took it upon ourselves to start working on um, what we called an, an open letter, um, really highlighting the value of animal agriculture during this this time. Um, you know, it talked about what farmers are doing during this crisis, how important it's going to be during that eventual recovery. Um, you know, really trying to refute that myth of a some of a connection between animal ag and COVID and urging those authorities to really stand up for the safety of livestock and, and working with the value chain during this difficult time. Um, we subsequently took that, that letter to some of our key partners, folks like the Animal Ag Alliance here in the US, um, a group called the European Livestock Voice in Europe, um, and folks in our network to uh, try to get signatories on board, you know, refine this and get it to a place where we could really create a, an effort across the value chain. Um, we are quite happy to see in the end, we had around uh, 75, 76 signatories across both public and private sector. Um, including all the major global livestock associations. So we were quite happy to have um, Donald and, and GDP on there, as well as folks like uh, International Meat Secretariat, Poultry Sector Feed, et cetera, as well as a number of associations from you know, US, Canada, Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when that was finally released, um, you know, we did see some nice positive reaction from those global policymakers and authorities um, in terms of raising this issue and, and getting them to, to stand up um, a bit more on this. But, you know, looking ahead, um, you know, as everyone has made clear, we, we are sort of in a bit of a new normal now. Um, the pandemic is still continuing, but we are at least able to start thinking about, you know, what comes next? How do we prepare for the future? You know, clearly the economic and societal impacts of COVID-19 will be felt for quite some time, um, but we do see some at least silver linings. You know, for instance, you know, consumers are now much more aware of our relationship with animals, you know, whether that's pets, livestock, or, or wildlife. And we are seeing, you know, they want to see safe food production, they want to see good animal health, you know, they recognize that one health um, mantra. You know, if animals are healthier, humans are healthier and it creates a, a healthier world for us. So in the short term, you know, we are really looking at just how do we continue to support our customers as they're adapting to this new world, to consumer demands, um, you know, socially distance operations, et cetera. But, you know, looking ahead in that long term, you know, 2021 and beyond, um, we are really honing in, I think, on three key areas. So first is, is obviously our core competency, you know, new tools for improving animal health. You know, despite COVID, you know, the fundamentals really haven't changed. You know, we are still looking at 10 billion people by 2050. You know, the SDGs um, are, are set to be hopefully achieved by 2030. And there's still a lot that needs to be done to, to support, you know, that growing population and, and these new pushes on, on the SDGs. And, 
you know, the key is going to be more production is necessary with fewer resources, resources per animal and, you know, stopping animal disease, improving the health for animal health of animals is going to be foundational to that. Um, in addition, uh, you know, again, you know, I, we see One Health really taking center stage, you know, that recognition that our health relies on the health of animals um, is, is certainly getting quite a bit of notice right now. And it's an opportunity to really build policy systems that recognize that. So whether that's, you know, better disease surveillance that includes wildlife, so we can see when potential zoonotic spillovers may occur, or, you know, whether it's more investment in some of the animal health research basics. So if uh, a spillover does occur, you know, the, some of the basic knowledge is already there that really helps us with, with reaction. And then finally, again, you know, there's more attention on animals than ever before. And that really presents an opportunity, I think, to improve consumer trust. Um, you know, folks are interested in the health of animals. They want to know how animals are being cared for. They want to know what's happening on the farm because of what they're seeing in the, in the news every day. So that's an opportunity to, you know, improve knowledge, improve understanding on some of these key issues that, you know, we talk about all the time, you know, this group Gazel talks about and all the members here talk about whether it's sustainability, preventative care, antibiotic use, et cetera. You know, this is a real opportunity to, uh, to speak with consumers and, and build that trust back with them. So thank you again for the opportunity. Um, I'll hand it back to you, Donald. Thank you very much for that, Alex. Um, we are running a few minutes behind and I do have some questions that have been posed. Um, there is still time if you wish to ask a question to share that with the group. Um, what I'm gonna do now though is um, on the screen, I will share, I have peeled out of the, um, see, are you able to see my screen? I have peeled out of the uh, chat function a number of questions that were asked that um, I don't think we have addressed yet. Um, the first question was from Kevin Burkham and it was really directed towards you, Liz. I'm not sure whether you're, uh, yes, you are, you're back on the line. Um, Liz, the question was around, um, what are the key sustainability, is sustainability issues that you see facing the pork industry and how as a sector are you addressing those? If you'd mind sharing your thoughts with us. Sure. There's you know, a couple things I can think of right offhand. One is right sizing. You know, at what point in time are we making the right amount of, of pigs for the global market? And do we have a global market anymore? Um, we've also worked very hard to do things like reduce the amount of water we're using, reduce the carbon footprint of the, the pork we're producing. A lot of that is being done with modern production facilities, which, um, in some cases, we have people who believe they are less sustainable than more sustainable. So that becomes a bit of a um, education and communications challenge. So, um, you know, at, at some point, I think we will reach a, a steady state where we are um, producing enough pork for the demand that we have globally and in the right places so that it can be easily transported to where it needs to be consumed. Thank you very much. Um, next question came from Mitch Cantor and it was really directed to most of our, most of our speakers today, but I'll, <clears throat> I think I'll focus this one in on the producer groups. Perhaps uh, Paul, we could start with you. Um, the question was, how long do you estimate it will take for the industry to normalize again uh, post COVID? Well, that's a good question, and I think it probably really depends on, you know, the degree to which we recover and the, the pace at which we recover, because so much of the challenge that we've endured in dairy has been, you know, as I said before, the, the closing of a lot of the food service sector and things like that, that if, you know, schools remain closed and virtual for longer periods of time and there's less, you know, as far as food service, that'll exacerbate that that difficulty, I think the normalization is really gonna depend on the, the timeline of the virus. I know some people say, we don't control when we get better, the virus does. And I think somewhat in the case of the dairy industry, that's very true because of the nature of the damage we've, we've been facing. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, let's go to uh, Fawn. We'll go north of the border for a moment. And um, Fawn, from Canadian perspective, do you have a view? 
No, I think if somebody knew the answer to that question, I think we'd all be uh, very rich. Because <laughs> I think it depends on, on you know, what's going to happen uh, with the second wave, what's going to happen, um, you know, with the vaccinations. With, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of unknowns at this point. But I do know that we're better prepared than we were in March when it hit. And so hopefully um, the future ramifications of this are um, smaller blips than, you know, those extremes um, that we saw. So, you know, I, I, I think that some of that fear has come out of perhaps, um, you know, the, f the futures and all these sorts of things which have huge ramifications. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. If you know, let me know. <laughs> Well, I guess the, the question in part is after COVID, how long might it take to recover? So, um, uh, Ashley, if you've got some, I, I note you've put your, I'm going by the people who've put their uh, cameras back on. So thanks. Ashley, can I go to you next? Oh, we haven't got sound. Now, now can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I had it muted two different ways. Um, well, you know, Fawn, I know the answer. So I'm going to become a very rich woman. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I too, I was going to say kind of similar to Fawn, I think that the second wave will be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how many um, it, here in the U.S., you know, with a, a, a big chunk of folks um, who, who eat out a lot um, and, and how, we, how that changes, of course, long term. Um, you know, we've shifted to retail now. Uh, we have a lot of restaurants, of course, that have gone out of business permanently, um, a lot of small businesses, which is unfortunate, of course. And so how how does that change? Do the, do, do other ones come back? Do Americans stay, you know, stay cooking more? I, I think there's, those are all some, some big questions in my mind. And again, I, and I think I mentioned this, I think one of the big things um, that I think, I, I guess I believe probably will stick around is that direct-to-consumer um, piece that that we saw more, um, we saw more of. I think, I actually think that will, I, I, I just think with, with the increasing trend of folks um, on the sustainability side that want more information about the food um, and how it's produced, uh, I think those, those trends will actually um, stick around, um, at least in, in large part. Um, and, and, and who knows, maybe this has a, an impact in pushing for, um, you know, traceability system uh, for animal diseases here in the U.S. Um, that, that, of course, is, is needed. So, um, so anyway, there's, you know, I think plenty, there's plenty of question marks still out there, uh, of course, but we can't, can't wait to get past this in general. And I hope that vaccine comes sooner rather than later. Thank you for thank you for sharing, Ashley. Uh, Liz, did you have anything to add? Yeah, the only thing I'd say that I have to add is the other uncertainty is the whole global supply chain. So we have had some disruptions um, based on COVID outbreaks in other countries. Um, we've, you know, and, uh, and unrelated to COVID, of course, we're working on right sizing compared on or considering trade policy of whatever administration happens to be um, uh, in charge in the US. So um, in addition to all of the uncertainties that COVID's brought into play, we still have our uncertainties with trade policy that will um, affect normalization of our industries. Mm. Mm. Could I say something, uh, Donald, just to maybe challenge the question a little, since this is about sustainable livestock? Uh, the question is, do we want it to normalize again? Do we want a, a food system in the US where we see massive problems with obesity, where we see a very clear uh, problem around low income groups in regards to getting healthy food? We have seen with the pandemic how it has hit certain groups, low income groups in the US. But also, as was said by the dairy group here, we have been in a five-year period where the income for dairy farmers have not been good. So the question is, do we really have a food system that is not profitable and that makes people obese? And how do we determine sustainable when we do our livestock? For instance, should we eat less meat and then pay a higher price for better meat, for example? 
those are some of the discussion points that are very relevant. Uh, and as a farmer's son, I'm so much in favor of protecting the farmer, but I'm also very interested in having a sustainable development of the way we produce food. Mm. Well, I guess the, the question you raise, Esben, is, is what is a new normal and maybe Doug do you have some thoughts on this from a, a manufacturer processor relating to consumers as well? Yeah Donald I certainly do and I, I agree with a lot of the recent comments I you know we use that language you know when will we get to a new normal and uh, you know normal what is normal right normal is, uh, is, is what we've become accustomed to and used to uh, and I think that what we're experiencing now is some fundamental shifts. Um, and how will um, uh, businesses, how will industries adapt to those shifts? Um, and, and a couple of, of, of previous speakers have, have talked about a few of those. I think we are experiencing a permanent shift uh, to higher levels of e-commerce. Um, I think we are also um, learning from what does effective and efficient global trade look like um, and global trade not just in the context of of, uh, of, 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 of tariffs and, and or absence of tariffs or of free trade but also in the context of a sustainable business continuity that as uh, manufacturers that are um, looking to deliver products that consumers want, they now have a higher responsibility to ensure that products are available. Mm -hmm. And what the pandemic has highlighted is that's no longer something that people can just take for granted. And, and it also is in guiding to questions around choice and around prioritization. So I, I, I do love the question that was posed is, do, do we want to return to the old normal that we that we had got accustomed to, um, and 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 I think we have to really recognize uh, and be a lot more thoughtful about what do we want out of the future, and how do we begin to really um, take steps towards getting to that better future? How do we leverage the learnings that we're all experiencing as a global society today um, that that will move things forward that aren't that aren't in a reactive mode? that are about a thoughtful, intentional mode. Mm. That's about sustainable practices from farming um, to um, providing consumers products that not just they want and need, but are good for them. That give transparency and deliver higher levels of efficiency of global trade. So uh, I, I'm very hopeful that through this crisis period of time, we've all talked about collaboration. We've all talked about um, the need for um, what have been commercial um, antagonists with each other to put that aside um, for good outcomes. And if we can leverage that momentum um, to not just deal with the short-term crisis, but to look after the right long-term future, uh, that, that I think is, is, is where um, hope can move to improvement, not just potential, but actually translating improvement. That's really interesting. I think um, you, your comments, Doug, and indeed your question has been about, you know, do we want to return to what was normal really is what's um, embedded in the next question we got, which was from John Ellenberger of uh, Venture 37. I don't think, I think John, I know John had to leave, so he may already have uh, gone, but he was asking, um, and to be fair, Fawn, um, he didn't put your name on here because you hadn't spoken yet, but I think he included, would have included you in this list. And it was, um, what do you see as the most important lasting changes likely to come from the pandemic? And if we think about those in terms of sustainable livestock and, and the food system, what do you see as uh, the most um, important lasting changes? And then he said, although it's not behind us, I wonder what you feel are likely structural changes to come from the awful experience. So maybe Fawn, can I start with you? And, you know, what do you think is going to happen to our system? Yeah, you know, I think that there's um, a couple of key things. I think um, there hopefully is going to be increased use of business risk management programs uh, and perhaps adaptations of those programs. And secondly, I think Ashley makes a good point that 
Um, I think there's probably going to be some shifts in in where um, where food channels um, how they work. And um, you know, I thought that Temple Grandin did a really great job of explaining the complexities. Sorry, my dog is in the background. <laughs> the complexities of you know, big is efficient. Um, big is is you know really great in in many ways. It enables us to do export and. And but also big is fragile, and so I think that there um, that we are going to see uh, consumers around the world look at at other channels as well. I don't think we're going to see that disappear entirely, but I think that we might see some further um, diversification. But I'd be wow. interested to know what others think. Yeah, thank you, um, Paul. You got some thoughts on this topic? Sure. Uh, well, <clears throat> I'd, I'd certainly agree with Fawn's comment about you know, increased emphasis and use on, on risk management tools. And that's something we're already trying to think about um, in, in our world. And, and I think, you know, Doug made a, a good point too about what the new normal, you know, should look like or what it's going to end up looking like. And, and even, even before the pandemic took hold, you know, we had, um, we had launched an initiative in the dairy industry called Net Zero and sort of a combination between National Milk and U.S. Dairy Export Council and DMI and Nutrient and Obviously, DFA is really front and center on a lot of the environmental efforts we're undertaking here, but getting to um, <clears throat> getting to carbon neutral as an industry as a whole by 2050, and seeing a lot of buyers are doing that. And I, and I sort of think that, the, you know, and, and Ashley made this comment too about people asking more questions about food and things like that, especially now. I, I imagine that, I, and I don't know if this is a lasting change exactly, but I think it might speed up um, higher for some of the change that was already in, you know, in the pipeline, if you will. And you know, again, that was something that we've been working on for quite a while prior to you know, March of this year when, when things really changed. But I, I do wonder if when we eventually come out of this, um, you know, we, we'll look at things differently as far as urgency of how we solve problems. And you know, that's not just you know, having a supply shortage at a plant or needing to, to modify how a plant is structured. I think it's broader than that too. You know, part of it is how we communicate about the products we make, but part of it is how we operate. And so I, I do wonder if some of the things we're already working on, at least in the dairy industry, from our perspective, will be sped up, if that might be a, maybe a, a, not a structural change, like I said, but, but a significant change. Mm. Thank you. Hey, Donald, can you hear me? Yes, Ashley. Okay, uh, sorry, I got kicked off the Zoom, so, but, I'm, but I'm, still here. I'm still here on audio. Hey, I was going to go back to Esben's question about, um, you know, sustainable food systems and, and you know, and, and changing it, because I think w one thing is when it has big shocks like this, it is nice to uh, be able to go to a high level and reflect on, uh, it, you know, what should change um, and, and maybe what was what was good. And I think on the sustainability front, you know, everything we do on sustainability to build a better system does, in fact, also make us more resilient to deal with issues like like this pandemic. And so, you know, NCBA and um, <laughs> and and I'll throw Fawn in here too. Uh, so NCBA is a member of the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Fawn used to run the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And so, you know, those groups are getting together to to you know, to analyze what are those issues, you know, to Tim's point, who's also on my USRSB board, um, to talk, to look at, you know, how do we, one, how do we protect the grasslands? So how do we make those forages um, better um, but, and, and make the, the grazing better? How, which also, you know, adds to the efficiency. How do we add the, again, I, I think I mentioned this before, how do we add those ecosystem services that, that diversifies revenue? You know, those all, all add up to a better, a better system um, that I think is, and, and Tim might weigh in here, but but better it is better in fact um, for nature, for the planet, uh, better for the farmer and rancher, better for the communities that, that are supported by those uh, livestock systems. Um, you know, so it's so really just more sustainable across the board. And, and I think, personally, in my opinion. Uh, if we had more people eating a high protein diet, we would actually uh, be better off um, on uh, the long term health front. So uh, again, I, I come back to that. But um, but again, I, I think we are working on a lot of those is issues. And I think this is um, everything that happened during the pandemic, you know, is is under the guise of sustainability. Um, and so we have to take, you know, that um, that term and 
and use, use all the lessons we've learned here during this pandemic to, to make a more sustainable food system. Nicely said too, Ashley. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Liz, did you have? Uh, I thought you were about to make a comment when Ashley came back on. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting to look at structure of the industry, and you know, there's the larger integrated systems that may have more resiliency on capital, and they may have more control over processing facilities and and being able to manage where their animals go. Um, and then what we saw is some of our middle-sized producers were those that were really stuck with having too many animals to be able to divert into local markets or to be sell, able to sell direct to consumers. Um, they were re really dependent on packing plants that were not able to take their animals. And they were maybe some of the most impacted and then some of the smaller producers could do those direct from farm sales, find smaller local markets. So there's really a bifurcation. And I saw our middle-sized producers, and some of those might be considered big. Those may be people with up to 20,000 sows, but, um, but they were the ones that seemed most vulnerable to these um, market disruptions that we had. And so to me, I think there will be a revisiting, a rethinking of what is the right size, is fully integrated the better model, or is fully independent and local the better model, or is it that, that combination of between um, of both? So I, I do think there will be some shakeout. I think that we will, um, you know, continue probably to um, right size the US industry um, based on, um, on the vulnerabilities of those, those types of um, systems. Mm. And I, re I don't disagree with anything anybody else said. Yeah, maybe if I could take these comments, Doug, and turn them into a question for you. I think, you know, from coming from overseas and having lived in the US for the last 10 years, I think that the cost of a calorie or the cost of you know you know food in the US is very inexpensive compared to other parts of the world and one of the ways we've driven costs down is this um, highly specialization you know we we we've, we've stripped all the cost out of our our industry and we've made it extremely specialized and very very um, efficient yet when we're when we face something like this pandemic, we don't have the flexibility that maybe right. was in smaller processors, et cetera. So is within DFA, have you given any, is there any discussion about, you know, how do we bring back some of that flexibility? Is there any consideration for a future? Yeah, no, uh, gr great question. And uh, you're exactly right that um, much of the U.S. industry, but I don't think it's unique to the U.S. industry. M much of the global industry um, has been pressured um, to take waste out and, and really to be most efficient. Hmm. And uh, the other thing that's occurred, which I, I think most folks are beginning to recognize, but innovation has also slowed. And what do I mean by innovation? That um, breakthrough innovation, meaning breakthrough products from big manufacturers has slowed down because of this topic you're talking about. That the return on investment calculation um, isn't as relevant as it used to be because consumers' preference for new has accelerated. And so it used to be that um, processors would look at a, a 10 year net present value calculation on a return on investment to make a big, a big capital investment related to new innovation. And they could count on, okay, I'm not going to see profits for three or four years hmm. while I implement that new innovation, but that's okay because in years four through 10, I'll, I'll get that back. Well, consumers are demanding innovation faster than that. And so as a result, they're looking for innovation in three to five year cycles, no longer 10. So it is having an impact on the level of investment big manufacturers are making because they're not getting the ROI uh, in that time horizon. Does that, does that make sense? Mm, it does. And, and, so, and, and so you're seeing a lot of large scale manufacturers buy up smaller companies that, that they're relying on those smaller businesses, accelerators, if you will, 
um, to do the innovation, but, but I'm concerned about that as well because you then have to take a look at the sustainability um, uh, uh, of, of, of that innovation. Um, are they delivering the food safety and quality that we all want to have within our respective food channels and, and, and beverage channels? And so it is a challenge we've got to figure out. Uh, I think one of the things that the pandemic has also highlighted um, is, is the need for um, dual sourcing um, and, 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 and uh, um, not just for currency hedging reasons, um, not just for uh, the challenges related to efficiency of, of path to market, but for flexibility and adaptability. And, and so I do think that that is one of the next big challenges for processors. Um, in all industries, yeah, is how do you make those choices and become more efficient while being a flexible and adaptable at the same time? Yeah, fantastic point, Doug. Thank you for that. Um, I am quite conscious of our time. We are only five minutes before the end, and I do want to give Mitch an opportunity to just share some some closing remarks. I've looked down the list of questions that were remaining. There were questions about export markets, questions about livestock, um, getting COVID, whether you could get COVID from livestock products. I think most of the other questions um, have been addressed through various presentations. Alex touched on the uh, uh, livestock impact on COVID, et cetera. Um, there's a couple of questions at the end here. Um, Fawn, I think you're still gonna get back to Tim at some point. Uh, with your uh, uh, the economics of um, uh, COVID compared to BSE. And um, Tim, there was a question for you. Dr. Cantor was un interested in what your uh, view at WWF was in terms of the, the uh, uh, nutritional benefits of plant versus animal protein sources. And perhaps that again is something we can take offline and have as a discussion with you. So um, Mitch, can I just ask you to maybe share some some thoughts from having observed sat through today in terms of the different presentations and any key themes and takeaways for you? Yeah, thank you, Donald. And thanks to all the speakers. I enjoyed that very much. Um, I was sitting here trying to type notes and listen at the same time, which uh, it's tough for me to multitask like that, but I, I, the discussions were excellent. Um, we'll put together a, uh, set of minutes or, or meeting conclusions, so it'll be more in depth. But I think for now, just in the minute or two that I have, a um, couple of commonalities that I heard, certainly among the producers, I think um, all the folks, whether they were coming from the dairy industry, beef industry, pork, um, said that COVID hit at a bad time, that um, the industries were, were under a little bit of stress before COVID hit um, from a sales perspective um, or, or other issues. And so the timing of it was not very good. Um, and in the early stages, back in the March, April timeframe, um, it hit particularly hard as, as uh, the industries started trying to figure out the best way to, to deal with uh, things. It struck me that uh, the beef and the dairy industry may have been able to weather things a little bit better than pork for various reasons, um, at the least of which um, uh, dairy said they were able to control production as an industry. And of course, there were also government um, programs in place to help uh, by the government um, designating food and ag as a critical service was helpful to be sure. But the ability, I think, for the industry to control production probably had a lot to do with why there wasn't as much glut in product and they didn't have to um, dump as much product. And similarly on the beef side, the ability to keep the animals on the farm longer, um, rather than bring them to a feedlot where there was no, no body to buy them um, was a big issue as well. Pork, um, to, to listen to that discussion with Liz, uh, it, it seemed that they were hit harder in terms of having to euthanize so many more animals and, and it seemed to hit the pork industry uh, rather hard in that regard. As far as some learnings um, overall, uh, listening to Doug uh, Glade speak from the dairy perspective, but I think the ag perspective in general, um, while it was interesting to hear him say, and, and a couple others alluded to the fact that there was some good news 
to come out of this from an act perspective and that consumers slowed down, stayed at home more, prepared more meals. So sales of, of a number of the products actually went up. But from an industry perspective, Doug talked about um, uh, the benefit of relationships. Having relationships in advance are important to be able to weather a crisis like this. Embracing technology as a way to communicate with um, your workforce and others has been very, very important. Focusing on solutions and not problems were discussed as well, being important during a time like this. Um, and, and learning from others, I think, struck me as well as being an important point. Um, from the NGO side of things, obviously folks uh, like Tim, Tim uh, Hardman and Esvin uh, and Alex see things a little bit differently. They came at it a little bit differently. And all three of them laid out a little bit of a blueprint from their perspective of how the ag industry might want to uh, proceed moving forward. Um, from the uh, WWF perspective, there was talk about um, shutting down high-risk wildlife consumption, stopping encroaching on nature, which could take on various forms, um, protecting and restoring natural habitats for animals, et cetera. And then Esvin spoke about um, the need to uh, promote uh, sustainable food systems, but that means different things around the world. Um, talked about government stimulus packages to help through the COVID crisis. Um, should have focused more from his perspective on sustainable food systems, maybe a little less on some of the uh, other industries um, like, like oil, um, et cetera, that, that benefited from um, some of the bailout programs. Um, overall, I, I think um, this notion, the, the last bit of discussion about uh, focusing on what does a new normal look like, I, I think is a very interesting question for further discussion. Um, I think it was Esben who asked the rhetorical question, do we wanna go back to the way things were? And that's provocative. Um, so I think, you know, I, I'm sure there'll be more discussions like that, both at the meeting in a couple of weeks and um, amongst folks within their own companies. So I think I will leave it at that. Um, I, as I said, there were similarities in some instances and differences among the various uh, producer groups as well. But overall, it feels like folks are learning to, have learned to adapt to COVID. Um, businesses are doing reasonably well and, uh, we're gonna just have to wait and see what the next wave brings. So again, thanks for the opportunity to listen in. Um, we'll put together a little more in depth summary and I will leave it at that. Thank you, Mitch. And so Mitch will produce a, a set of proceedings from our, our conversation today that will be circulated to everyone who um, signed up for today's webinar. Um, I think a great point for us to leave on is the one that Doug was making about learning from others. And I think it's been stressed by several other people on the call, the need for collaboration across the totality of the livestock sector. And uh, we started today's discussion with uh, something of uh, an advertisement for Gassel um, from Fritz. And I'd go back to that and say, you know, we as uh, now if I change hats and put on my hat as the executive director of the Global Dairy Platform, we found enormous support within the global agenda for sustainable livestock, talking to other livestock producing groups in the way that we as a dairy sector can enhance not just um, the work we're doing in sustainability, but how we communicate uh, the work we do as well. And one of the things that we've been talking uh, within Gassel about is creating more of a communications collaborative effort that takes into account all the different viewpoints of the multi-stakeholder process so that we as a livestock sector can become better advocates for the sustainable uh, the sustainability of our own of our own sector so with that i am going to thank you all for your participation today i particularly wish to thank all of our speakers paul fawn liz and ashley who spoke on behalf of the uh, producer groups. Guys, thank you for not just your time today, but also for the work that you do um, in representing your, your sector groups. That's um, very much appreciated. Um, Doug, thank you for being the, uh, 
the uh, manufacturer processor who was willing to tell us, um, you know, from your perspective, how things are, are operating, certainly appreciated and uh, definitely picked up some useful tips from your talk today. Um, to Tim Hardman and to Esben, Esben uh, sent me a note, he had to run to another call, but to both of you, thank you for sharing your perspective. As I said earlier, if we don't bring together all of the different perspectives, be it you know, civil society, NGO groups, as well as governments, donors, um, manufacturers, producers, farmers, et cetera, we're never going to solve some of the problems that sit in front of us. So thank you for sharing your viewpoints. Um, very much appreciated. And last, but by no means least, Alex, um, thank you for sharing the, the work that you're doing within the animal care industry. Uh, again, very much appreciated. So my thanks to those of you who have stuck with us all day. I know um, uh, Suzuki-san in Japan, thank you. I just saw your comment coming in. Um, thank you for, uh, I think you get the prize again, Suzuki-san, for um, the latest at night or the earliest in the morning. And to those people from Europe, um, particularly our colleagues at FAO and Gassel, thank you for your leadership in this area. With that, I um, will end today's call and um, look out for the proceedings to come to you via email. Bye for now, everyone.